Okay. Well, good morning, afternoon, or evening, uh, everyone, wherever you may be. Um, it is now nine o'clock mountain time. Um, so it's time to uh, get started with our first presentation of the day. Um, and this will be on the, uh, the pre-processing for the UFS uh, short range weather app. And um, this will be presented um, by Jeff Beck, George Gano, and uh, Larissa. Um, sorry, Larissa, I forgot to look up your last name. Um, and uh, it, it, it's Reams. Reams, Larissa Reams. That's fine. <laughs> um, and uh, they'll be kind of uh, tag teaming this presentation to uh, give the uh, the best overall uh, expertise experience on on the system. And um, it's uh, it's one after, so uh, I see I keep seeing a few people trickle in, but uh, I guess we'll we'll go ahead and get started. Um, and I think Jeff will be presenting first. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, so yeah, like you said, we'll be tag teaming this presentation. There are quite a few um, utilities that are required for pre-processing, and so we felt it best to split this up. Um, and so I'll be presenting the first section on the utilities that you see here on the screen. Um, these handle uh, generation of the grid and the orography um, and filtering of the orography um, and a couple other uh, smaller utilities. And then I'll uh, pass off to George who will go over uh, surface climo and then uh, Larissa who will uh, cover change risk cube. And sorry, so, Jeff, not, not to, I, I forgot to mention one thing, just as a reminder to yes. everybody, um, please, when you have uh, questions, either raise your hand um, or post them in the uh, Slack uh, under the presentations channel. Um, and uh, I'll be sure to uh, make sure the pre presenters uh, can see your questions and get them answered. Okay, thanks, Mike. Um, so yeah, so I'll start off with the, we're, we're gonna go in order in terms of what the uh, short range weather app uh, does in terms of the end to end workflow. Um, so the first, uh, the first utility uh, that I'll go over, well, actually, before I even go over any of the utilities, um, uh, we have an introductory slide here to discuss the actual repository where all of these are housed, which is UFS utils. And um, so it contains numerous utilities which are required for the app. And um, if, if you run the app um, in an end-to-end -end manner, uh, then this, this repository is checked out automatically uh, and built automatically. Um, for those users who are interested in actually looking at the code and the source code itself in the, in the repository, um, you can find the repository here at this address. Um, and for the short range weather app, uh, we're really interested in, in the release branch, uh, release public v2, and then the develop branch. Uh, those are the two that we uh, typically use uh, with this repository. So uh, the SORC directory is where all of the utility source code is housed in, uh, in, in where it's used uh, by the short range weather app. And they consist of all of these utilities here and a few others that I haven't even listed. Um, but these are the majority of the ones that uh, the short range weather app uses. Um, and then the code uh, support uh, that we have for this code, um, it exists. We support all NOAA HPC. Um, we support Cheyenne, generic Linux, and Mac OS. OS. Um, and you can feel free to go to the UFS users forum. I put the link in here so that you can find that if you have any problems or run into any issues with pre-processing on any of these utilities, uh, you can find the uh, initialization section uh, on the UFS user support forum uh, and post a question there. And uh, all the subject matter experts uh, for these utilities uh, will be able to view your question and, and hopefully respond and get a resolution to your problem. Um, so if, if you are looking for additional information uh, on the, the repository itself, uh, you can find the wiki page here at the bottom of this slide and uh, feel free to go uh, peruse that um, and um, to get more information on the, on the repository. So I'll go ahead and start um, with an overview of the regional ESG grid utility. So the first step that happens in the app is to create the grid itself. Um, and we use what's called the extended Schmidt mnemonic grid for the short range weather app. Um, and this is a very uniform grid that was developed by Jim Purser at EMC. Um, it's an excellent uh, homogenous grid that uh, was developed and is 
uh, the way we're going to move forward uh, with the short range weather app in the future and in operations as well. So um, if you select a predefined domain in the short range weather app, then uh, the uh, workflow will automatically set the necessary nameless parameters for this utility to create the grid uh, during the make grid task um, based on uh, variables that are defined in this uh, file here, set predefined grid parameters. And we have quite a few predefined grids that you can choose from that are in that file. Um, and so you don't need to worry about any of those details on how to create the grid uh, if you use the end-to-end -end system and you use a predefined grid. Um, but just for more, uh, you know, some details on how this actually works, uh, the ESG uh, grid code, regional ESG grid, uses this name list here. Um, and I've uh, filled this in with an example uh, domain, the three kilometer CONUS RFS domain uh, that we have as a predefined option. And you'll see that um, it's, it's pretty straightforward in terms of what's included in the name list. You have your angle increment uh, for the, the grid resolution in, in the X and Y direction. Uh, you have the number of points uh, on the super grid, uh, which is relative to the center domain uh, defined as LX and LY center latitude and longitude, and then uh, what's called a PASI parameter, which is an azimuth parameter, which represents the orientation of the grid. And so most of the grids have a zero orientation, although one uh, exception is the um, RFS North American three kilometer domain, which is rotated slightly. And so that's a required parameter uh, that needs to be defined. So, um, sorry, I have to move my screen so I can see all of my screens here. All right. Um, when uh, we generate a new grid, uh, if you want to generate a new grid, um, the goal would be to use one of the pre-existing domains um, as a template in this set predefined grid parameters file. Um, and all you would need to do is define the grid center Latin lawns, grid spacing in kilometers, and the number of grid points without the halos. And I'll explain what the halos are in a second. Um, and the workflow will calculate the corresponding uh, nameless parameters. But I won't go into any more details on how to create your own grid, which obviously is a very important um, goal that a lot of people have. Maybe they want to run a sub conus domain over a certain region. Um, so I would uh, uh, hopefully you'll be able to see Gerard's uh, talk later uh, this afternoon on defining a new domain, and you'll get all the details on what you need to do um, in that talk. So. Um, what does the regional ESG grid produce? Well, it's just a single net CDF output um, that's named regional grid uh, and it has six halo files. What are halos? So you can think of these as extra um, points, uh, grid points on each side of all four sides of the domain where the lateral boundary conditions are applied. Um, and the, the make grid workflow task um, will then take this regional grid um, file and copy it to a new file name using a format that's required by the FE3 executable. And this includes a, a C resolution. I think the C originally stands for cube, um, but somebody can correct me if that's not right. Um, and I'll explain what that is in a second. It includes uh, the number of halo cells. So again, those areas where the LBCs are defined uh, and then the tile number. And in this case, tile seven uh, is always what you're going to see for the short range weather app since tile seven is the uh, the regional grid, uh, which uh, is separate from the original uh, one through six tiles for a global um, uh, grid, which you would use for the medium range weather app. And so this C or cube resolution is essentially the number of points along one tile of a uniform global domain. But for the regional grid, um, we don't have a global domain. So it's an equivalent uh, C resolution, which is calculated if it were a global uh, domain based on the grid spacing at the center of the regional domain. And so this is calculated by utility, again, included in UFS utils called global equivalent resolution, um, which is called during the make grid task, which all of these are currently called during the make grid task. And so it calculates that equivalent uh, C resolution. And so once all that's calculated, then the code uh, copies this regional grid uh, file over to um, an example, here's an example for a three kilometer conus domain. So it's a 33357 C resolution. You have tile seven and it lists the number of halo points here. Um, and so this, this uh, format, again, is necessary for the FE3 executable. It's also necessary for all the other um, pre-processing utilities listed here uh, to, to properly read that file in and then calculate whatever those extra utilities need to do uh, in order to work.
So um, once we have our grid file, then we need to create what's called a mosaic file as well. And this is used by the FE3 uh, executable as well. It provides general information about the grid um, that is required to run uh, the model. Um, again, this is part of the make grid workflow task. So this is all handled automatically when you issue the make grid task. Uh, it reads in that CRES based grid file which is produced by regional ESG grid and then creates a, a, a mosaic NetCDF file. And here's an example of what that uh, file name is. It's located in the grid directory uh, when running the app. And this just contains um, the number of tiles. In this case, it's always gonna be one. The tile name, the grid file uh, name here, here is an example, and then the path to that grid file. So the FE3 executable knows where to find it. It's a pretty simple um, utility there. After that, we need to create the orography. Um, and that's the orog utility. And this is all handled in the make orog task of the workflow, which uh, first uh, copies in uh, stages uh, 30 second fixed files, which are used to create the raw topography file. Um, and uh, it also handles the command line arguments to pass to the orog utility itself. Um, and it reads in that C resolution conforming mosaic and grid file. Um, and then creates the raw net CDF topography file itself based on those uh, fixed, the fixed file, the 30 second fixed files um, with six halo cells again here. And so this is an example of the or orography, raw orography file uh, that is created. And so after that's done, um, there's a filter topography utility that will go in and filter some of the topography as a function of the resolution uh, of the grid. And uh, so it will take in the raw topography file created by the ORG utility. And um, then again, the make ORG task will handle the nameless generation on the fly for this filter utility. So user doesn't have to do anything here. It's all under the hood. Um, and it uses assumptions about uh, the stretch factor um, and the C resolution to filter the raw topography. So it's important to note that this filter utility was originally written for the global domain. So it has a, a stretch factor, which we're not using for the ESG grid. Um, in fact, the stretch factor really should be set to one because we're not doing any stretch factor. If you set the stretch factor greater than one or less than one, then you have some sort of uh, stretching on the grid and we don't have that. Um, unfortunately, uh, since the filter topo, topo utility hasn't been adapted to non-uniform regional grids, um, we have to set this to 0 0.999, otherwise the executable thinks the grid is global and it will crash because it can't find the other tiles. So we really need uh, someone to go through and, and refactor this code, re rework the code to make sure it will run with both global and non-uniform regional grids. Um, and so in addition to the stretch factor of nearly one, uh, we also supply the equivalent global C resolution because again, we don't have a global C resolution, we have what, what we call the equivalent version of that. And so both of those are, are supplied to the filter topo utility. And then it then interpolates or extrapolates between or beyond a set of seven C resolution values um, based on uh, the filter par filtering parameters. Um, and then uh, it, it applies those to create the, the, the final filtered topography file. And it replaces the original raw topography file with the new filtered output, which probably shouldn't be the case. We should probably be creating a, a new raw topography file with a, a new name so that we keep the raw uh, file as well um, to make sure that you know we don't overwrite things. So, um, it, and then uh, finally the make orog task then copies the output to a CRES compliant uh, file name with the halo number. So again, this is uh, the final result of filter uh, topo uh, using that CRES compliant um, file name for, uh, for the FE3 executable. Okay, so I talked about those halos before and all these utilities so far have produced halos of, of six. And the reason we produce six is because um, we need enough uh, halo information uh, to, uh, to shave it down. And that's essentially what this, this shave utility does um, because the FE3 executable requires um, different numbers of halos for different files. So you can see here for the grid files, the FE3 requires one uh, grid file with a halo of three cells, another with a halo of four cells. So this is just for internal information in the model that it, that it requires these separate files. I don't actually know the details of why it has to have 
uh, one grid file with three and another with four. Um, someone else may know more about the, the guts of the FV3 model that could provide information on that. But this is also true for the orography file. You need one uh, orography file with four halo cells and another with no halo cells. So in order to get that, uh, we start with a larger halo and then we take the shape utility and just cut it off um, by a number of rows uh, on the edges of the domain. And so uh, it, again, it's applied to the original grid and the filtered orography files. Uh, these are two examples right here for the three kilometer conus uh, domain. And it's this utility is called in both the make grid and make org task, tasks because it needs to trim both of those files. Um, and uh, here's an example of what you can see if you go into the grid directory and your run directory, um, you'll find uh, three grid files, three mosaic files, um, both uh, three sets of each. Um, and the original uh, grid and mosaic file will have the whoops, will have the six halos. And then the shave utility will shave them down to three and four each. And then an example of the um, final uh, uh, ORAG file here shows two uh, ORAG files, one with a halo of zero and another with a halo of four. So those were trimmed down. And the original halo six file is, is in another directory within ORAG. So it's still saved even after you run shave. Okay. So that is the first set of uh, UFS utils pre-processing utilities. So we have the, um, the grid and the orography created, and now we're gonna um, focus on the climatology information. So I'll go ahead and pass this to George and I'll be forwarding uh, the slides as George uh, goes through these slides. All right, can everyone hear me? Yep, I can. All right, I'll be talking about the next uh, program in the sequence, and it's called Surface uh, Climogen. Uh, next slide, please. Surface Climogen stands for Surface Climatological Field Generation. So it runs as the last step when you create a new model grid. So uh, the types of fields it creates are climatological surface fields, things such as uh, vegetation type or plant greenness fraction. And it creates these from different global data sets. Now, some fields are static like vegetation or soil type. Uh, they don't change through the year, uh, but some are time varying. So some are like a monthly climatology, uh, for example, our plant greenness. Um, and again, so fields, these, these are fields that only change when the grid, meaning the land mask or the orography change. So once you set up your grid, you don't need to run this program again. Uh, the program is, it's parallel um, and it was built around the ESMF library. And I did that because um, at the time, NSEP didn't have any uh, interpolation libraries that could handle this, um, this crazy uh, mnemonic cube sphere grid. So ESMF was able to handle that. Um, and for regional grids, um, the program will output files that include the halo and without the lateral halo region. Uh, next slide. Uh, the source code is located it's under the UFS utils repository under the SORC directory. And there's about uh, eight or so uh, Fort Fortran modules. Uh, there's a driver routine. Uh, there's an interpolation uh, driver uh, that will read the input source data and then interpolate it to the model grid. Uh, there's a model grid module, which defines this, what we call a ESMF grid object for the model grid. Uh, there's an output module that writes the output data to NetCDF files. And for regional grids, it will output separate files with and without the halo. There's a program setup utility that reads the name list and sets up the program execution. Uh, there's a search utility. And what this does is uh, there will be times when points on your model grid may not have any information, the input data set may not have any information for that particular model grid. And 
an example is an isolated island out in the middle of, of the ocean. Uh, in those cases, um, you, we have to do a search to try to find a valid value. And if there is no valid value, we'll actually end up giving you a default value. Uh, there's also a um, module for the source grid and that will read in the source grid, um, um, the land mask and the grid specs for the source data and sets the ESMF grid object. And then we have a utilities uh, uh, module that contains things such as error handling utilities. Next slide. All right, now the global data sets required by this program are located on the FTP site. Um, there are about three different albedo uh, data sets we use. Uh, there's a, a soil substrate temperature data set. And what that does is it sets the lower thermal boundary condition for the land surface model. Uh, we have a, a soil type data set, a vegetation type data set, and a, a plant greenness data set. So those are those set of global data sets are, are input and they're all net CDF. And for the model grid data, to define the model grid, the program reads in the mosaic files and the, um, the grid files that are produced by the regional ESG grid utility that Jeff just talked about. And also it, it ingests the orography files um, as well from the orography utility. Next slide. Uh, here's an example of the uh, global data sets that are uh, read in by this particular program, at least the file format. I did a quick dump of the NetCDF header. Uh, right now, the program assumes that the input data is on a regular lat-long grid. Um, now, for this particular header dump is from the vegetation type and just some of the different uh, fields that are in some of the different metadata in the file includes uh, IJ dimensions, um, number of time periods. For, th for this particular data, since it's vegetation type and it doesn't change through the year, we have one time period. If it's something like the plant greenness, there'll be 12 time periods. Um, under variables, we'll have a valid time of each record using days since uh, January 1st. Uh, we also have uh, specify the grid center latitude and the grid cell corner latitude and longitude for each point. And uh, then the data itself is um, then specified with, what, with a missing value. And the missing value is placed at points for, the, for vegetation type, since there's no data at ocean points, uh, we set that to a missing value. And that's how the program determines where there is data and where there is not, because it just does a series of masked interpolations. And um, again, you are, uh, if you have your own data set and you'd like to try it, you can set up your net CDF file using this format. Uh, feel free to try your own data. It's only been tested with uh, regular lat lawn grids, but there's no reason it couldn't be updated to work with other uh, data sets as well. Um, next slide. Uh, these are just a, a list of the, the name list options the program requires. The first um, eight or so are the path name of the global input data sets. And then uh, the, the last three at the bottom here are the, uh, for the model, the mosaic, the name, path and name of the mosaic file, the path where the orography file is located, and then the name of the orography file itself. Next slide. Uh, there's also, you can specify the number of uh, halo rows and columns. Um, and then for um, a couple of the different uh, uh, fields, you can choose between a bilinear or a conservative interpolation method. Um, 
for these particular fields, I'm not sure a conservative conservative method is really um, would really benefit you in in any way. The default is bilinear. Um, I guess if we ever go to something like uh, if we ever need a climatological snow data set or something hydrological, a conservative uh, interpolation would help preserve the uh, you know amount of water, the water balance across the across the grid. But for now, we just use bilinear. Next slide. Uh, output files, uh, all files are output with and without the halo, all in, in NetCDF. And, um, and there's just a list, as I mentioned before, there's a few albedo files, veg type, greenness fraction, and, and soil type. Next slide. And uh, here, here's an example of what, um, what comes out of the program. This is, um, this is actually from a global, this is a global tile too. And you can see on the east there, that's Africa and India in the middle. So this is, this is soil type. And um, all files are, that come out of this program are then input to the Change Res Cube program. And what change res cube will do uh, for time varying fields is it will read in the proper records for your cycle time, do a linear interpolation in, in time and set the field in, in that manner. Now, uh, there is a uh, change res cube option that can override this option for some fields. Um, and there is a way to use her based fields instead. And I guess more on this option, uh, I guess, oh, Larissa will explain us a little more during during her talk, but again, for the most part, um, the different uh, surface fields that come out of surface climogem are then passed to Change Res Cube to set um, some of some of the fields on the surface. Next slide. All right, I'll pass it on to Larissa if there aren't any questions. Um, actually, uh, a question just did come in, um, and uh, Chongqi, I don't know if you want to uh, unmute and uh, state your question again. Yeah, Mike, I can respond to that. I think it. I can. Re I can repeat the question too. Um, okay. Yeah. Sorry. I mean, that's why I was waiting to see if <laughs> if uh, yeah, Chongqi was going to say something, but. Uh, the question is, as mentioned, some surface variables are time sensitive. Does this mean that pre-processing pre has to be rerun for cases at different times, for example, summer versus winter cases? And yes, the answer is yes. Uh, it's very specific to the date uh, that you're running in particular. Um, uh, and it's a, the other question, follow-up question is, do the users have to provide date time info when rerunning, when running the pre-processing? So if you're running the app, then your date information is going to be passed to all the pre-processing utilities. So you just don't need to worry about that. But yes, all that information is used in pre-processing. And there is also a uh, hand up in the chat. Um, Russell, you want to ask your question? Just a five second question. Um, on the topography filtering, are there any controls that you can change and control and what goes on in the uh, filtering, you know, so that you can apply different types of filtering in different parts of the world where the orography can be quite strange, e.g. over the Himalayas yeah, that's or something? A, that's, a, that's a good question, Russell. It's, it's all resolution dependent and it's all hardwired um, based on the resolution. And um, that, that would be great to have those user um, options available uh, in the future. Um, it's more of less of a black box to most of us um, in terms of how it handles the, the filtering, um, but I do know it, it has the filtering um, set for a number of, of C resolutions and then interpolates based on what is provided uh, to the code. Um, but in terms of the actual details of how it's filtering and what it does, I, I can't speak to that too much. Um, and Gerard, I know you looked at it a little bit as well. I don't know if you have anything to add. Um, I don't know exact, I know, okay, so it depends, the way it does the filtering depends on the C resolution value, 
which you know it's it's sort of a bug actually because um, it should really depend on the physical resolution in terms of like kilometers and I have an issue set up for that but um, I am not the original author of that uh, filtering code and I am not sure uh, who or when is going to take a look at that. I think it was developed at EMC, but I I took a look at it, look at it last night, and it says GFDL. So oh, it's a GFDL thing. Okay, I think so. I think it it was originally developed. I'm assuming for the global C resolution, which would make sense that they would base it on on a uniform grid like that. Yes, um, that's what happens, yep. So, um, OK, uh, there was one other question from June Park. Um, thanks, Gerard. Um, regarding global data sets employed in surface climo, I found that the resolutions of data sets are somewhat different according to variables. Yes, that's true. So I'll type in veg type. Our 0.05 degrees zenith angle albedo 1 degree substrate 2.6 by 1.5 degree. I wonder if this affects the high resolution simulations with the app or not. Is there any plan or a project to update these ancillary data sets with more high resolution? That's a great question, June. Um, and we would like to have the highest resolution that you know is available for the fixed data. Um, I don't know too much of the details on that. Maybe uh, George Gano can, can add uh, some context there. A lot of these data sets were uh, taken from uh, the global GFS model. So, um, so at that, at the resolution of the GFS, these data sets were, were sufficient, but uh, you're correct there. We should be looking for higher resolution data sets if we're gonna be running very high resolution regional codes. Maybe you can pinch some of the data sets that WRS uses. Yeah, that's a great point, Russell. And we've actually talked about doing that and um, potentially using some of those data sets um, that jump through some hoops to get them to work with surface climo, but it's definitely something we're investigating. All right, I don't see any other questions. So I guess we can uh, move into Larissa's portion of the talk. Okay. Uh, so now that we have the grid and the surface climo files, we're ready to process all of that data into something that FD3 can actually read. And that is where change res cube comes in. Next slide. Um, so we, uh, so far we, we've talked about how there's, there's several different grids um, that the short range weather app supports three kilometers, 13 kilometers and 25 kilometers. Do make note of these equivalent uh, C resolution uh, values. Those were from when we were nesting um, in the global grid, but they are used in some of the file names as you've seen. So when you see C something or other, that's what it's referring to. But you can think of them as the various kilometer resolutions like you would in the, in the wharf. Uh, you can run the various other utilities for all these predefined regional grids. As long as you point to the output from those utilities on the disk, um, change res cube does need to be rerun for every case, uh, different dates, different times, because it, it's ingesting the actual model data that you're providing it now from an external model like the, the GFS. The uh, the change res cube is it only constitutes the pre-processing component, um, and it uses additional information uh, that's defined in the config.sh if you're running with the app. Of, but uh, a lot of what we'll be talking about here is going to be specifics if you wish to run outside of the app, so you're capable of uh, running things on your own, like the others have described. Brief note: Jeff mentioned this uh, to begin with. But I'll mention uh, in a couple of situations, the develop branch versus the release branch. Uh, since this release was several months old now, we've made some improvements and added some features to the develop branch. So in some cases, if there is a feature you would like to use, the app might not support it. So you would have to run UFS or you'd have to run at least the change res cube step on your own 
to make sure that you can take advantage of those, um, those new features. Okay, next slide. So basically, like I mentioned, Change Res Cube provides a file that FV3 can read for those familiar with WARF that's similar, some combination of ungrib, metgrib, and real.exe all combined into one because it takes the raw model output uh, and the what would be the equivalent of like your geogrid.exe file. That's what all of the stuff that, that Jeff and George talked about. And it takes the model grid output, combines them all together, and provides you with something that the model can read. Uh, ESMF is used in pretty much every part of the code. It does all of the interpolation from the model grid, the input model grid to the target model grid. And it, it started with uh, the, the old NSEP global change res uh, format and has been significantly updated to provide a ton more features and make it um, a lot more efficient as well. We support lots of different model sources, uh, specifically for the short range weather app. We have tested GFS wrap per data. Uh, we talked yesterday about uh, potentially in the future supporting stuff like the UK Met or the ECMWF. That's not in there yet, but that's certainly something that we could talk about. Uh, we support the GFS data in its net CDF format. Uh, wrap and her are generally in GRIB2 format. And then the old uh, GFS in NEMS.io format is still supported. Um, though for the most part in the short range weather app, you'll probably be using the GRIB2 data. Generally, the output is two net CDF initial condition files for regional domains. So you have the, the surface and the atmosphere file. And then uh, what's different from the global domain is obviously that you need the boundary conditions for each time step that you want to provide them. And those are produced on the halo that Jeff and George talked about. So halo and we offer a blending option that just tacks on extra data points onto your boundary conditions for uh, blending into the domain once the actual model runs. Next slide. So the inputs to change res, um, down there at the bottom, those should all look very familiar. Those are all of those surface climo fields and files that, uh, that George talked about. And they're all gonna be the tile seven. I, these, uh, these don't have the halo field files on them or the halo tags on them, but I do believe that these should have um, the halo four on them. And then, uh, at the top, you'll see that it needs a vertical coordinate definition file. Those are the vertical coordinates that you want to run your model on. So I believe in the short range weather app, it uses 64 or 65. So that would be in the place of LEVs there. You need the mosaic file, the grid tile, grid file and the orography file that were all generated in those previous steps as well. So none of these inputs require any additional work on top of what uh, Jeff and George already described previously. You're just one, one more step further. Okay, next step. But then those are the static inputs, but then comes the actual model information that changes date to date and case to case. So uh, as I mentioned before, NEMS.io, SIG.io, um, FE3, GFS, NetCDF, and GRIB2 files are all supported and can all be run uh, through Change Res Cube to produce output that the model can read. But for the app and for most regional cases, GRIB2 file is the most readily available. It's smaller and easier to download from external locations. And in a lot of cases, it's higher resolution than you might get from some other sources, especially with stuff like the HER that's provided at three kilometer resolution. Um, so before the regional app, it were, we, we only supported NEMS.io and SIG.io and FB3 GFS NetCDF because generally they are the most complete files that contain a lot of information, but that does mean that they're large and hard to access and they're not usually archived for very long. So with that in mind, there are some, some uh, uh, data that 
don't exist in most or any GRIB2 files. And that does include the uh, SST data and ice thickness and temperature that are not included for any, I don't believe they're in any GRIB2 files. So in those cases, NSST data, you just would not process for most regional domains. And then the other variables that are not included, they would use the default values, um, either a single value or using some sort of search uh, routine that George described in the, um, in the surface climo uh, change res cube has a similar function for that. In addition, some GRIB2 files, uh, particularly GFS with ozone and relative humidity or other tracers, um, at non-critical levels, so for example, ozone near the surface or humidity and tracers near the top of the atmosphere, they're missing or the, the data is empty or the, the levels just don't exist in the data. So we do have to choose a way that we want to treat that. You can either fill it with some really, really small value. You can fill it with zeros or you can choose to interpolate between the level above and the level below that you do have. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about um, how you would set that in the variable mapping table um, in the next couple of slides. So then there's some more specifics down there at the bottom of exactly what kind of variable or what kind of models and the format of them are supported. Note, it, note in the first bullet point there, I mentioned the FE3 GFS uh, is provided for more recent cases in a PGRIB2 and as well as a uh, P plus BGRIB2. But that second, uh, that second data type, uh, because of some uh, oddities with the file that's only supported in the most recent developed branch, we had to make some um, some caveats and some adjustments to the code to accept those files. So for if you really wanted to use that data, most I believe the people using it want it because it has more wind at more levels than just the other file type, you would need to use a develop branch specifically for that file type. Um, again, we the, the most the, the broadest file type supported is just general GRIB2 files, the GFS, NAM, RAF, and the HER. And then the, uh, the all the old global um, file types, spectral, GFS, SIGIO, NEMSIO, FE3, GFS, NetCDF. Um, but generally, in the if you're using it through the app, you're going to be using GRIB2 files. Next slide. So uh, I'm, I'm not going to go through the specifics of exactly what these files will look like when you go looking for these at external locations. Um, but I do provide some links here. You can, there are lots of places that you can get it from. HPSS, if you have access to NOAA systems, those go back in some cases many, many years. I believe uh, Jeff mentioned that even with, whoa. What just happened, Jeff? Sorry, that's my fault. <laughs> Was it some sort of update? <laughs> oh, you clicked on it, don't... nice. I don't, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I, I believe Jeff mentioned that HPSS has uh, all of the HER data, um, or at least that, that's what he thinks. So in uh, HPSS, if you do have access to it, is going to be uh, a pretty extensive source. But for the user who does not have those access, we still have uh, Nomads data where for approximately the past 10 days or so. Uh, those are usually going to be, I believe, the same kind of files that you would get from HPSS in some cases. And then you have the NCEI archive. Those are usually, um, they've been processed to remove some, uh, or some levels of data in some places to compress those files so that they're smaller for storing. At least the last six months are usually available online, uh, sometimes more in, in various cases. And then of course there's the AIRS archive uh, where you can go back and request data from quite a while ago, uh, though we can't guarantee that we can support data from that long ago as, uh, as we mentioned yesterday. And then for her data, if you do not have access to HPSS, all of the her data 
back to 2012, I think, is stored on both uh, Amazon Web and Google Cloud storage. So uh, those, you do have access to those now. For ex the exact file names and exact links to these various data uh, data sets on their in their various locations, I've provided links there to the so the documentation. It it would have been a, a wall of word vomit that uh, wouldn't have uh, wouldn't have helped a whole lot in this situation. And we also provide uh, name uh, really explicit name list options for the various sources that you would want to use there at that uh, that documentation link as well. Next slide. <clears throat> so for the variable mapping table that I mentioned, uh, it, it controls how Change Res Cube handles variables that may be missing or may not be missing from external GRIB2 files. Like I mentioned, GRIB2 tends to be a little bit more variable than SIGIO or NEMSIO or NetCDF type files. So each, uh, I believe we provide a couple of these examples, uh, which should get you through everything you need. But if you wanted to try and change it up to see for, for your own reasons, um, it, it, it's, a, it's just a text file with a, a table with five columns. The first column is the variable name that the code searches for in the GRIB2 files. And then the second column is the name that would be written out to the NetCDF files. I suggest not changing either one of those unless you have a really, really good reason to. You don't want to go changing a name of a file in the NetCDF file, uh, of a name in the NetCDF file that FE3 reads and then it, it doesn't know that variable name. So the second, uh, the next three column or the next two columns are some that you might choose to change. The column three is the behavior that would happen if a certain level of your data is missing. So say uh, near the top of the atmosphere, you're missing relative humidity. You can either skip the entire variable, I would suggest against that, but that's an option. You can set it to a fill value. So um, if, if you just want to output really, really small values near the top of the atmosphere for relative humidity, which isn't always the worst idea, you can use that and then in column four, you set what that value actually would be. We recently in the develop branch provide an interpolation option that would, if you have data above and below your missing level, we will interpolate a linear, just a linear interpolation and in pressure of that uh, pressure weighted interpolation to that level or stop. Uh, that would complete, that would, that would throw an error and the code would stop and you would not get any output Use that only if you really want to make sure that you have, when you say you want a variable, you make sure that ChangeRose is getting all of the data for that variable that you want it to get. So if it's not there, it will stop. There, are, I believe, uh, so if, if you put in an entry for temperature, you know, you probably want to have temperature on every level of your data. So that would be something that you would want the code to stop if it can't find, and perhaps your, your, your input data is malformed somehow. And as I mentioned, uh, <clears throat> if column three is, set, is uh, set to fill, then column four value is used to fill. Um, and note that some of these fill values may be, oh, if, you, if, one of, if you've set a, a, a value here for uh, one of the surface variables, even if you set it to fill, it may be overwritten by climatology for certain variables. I don't believe we use the variable mapping table much for the surface fields, um, but you could. And then column five is also important. It tells the code which of your uh, arrays that you're reading in from the external model data is a tracer. It uses this to decide um, what to read in and what to output uh, from the tracer. It, uh, in the old, it, Change Res also offers an option for non-GRIB2 data in the input to provide input tracer names and output tracer names. This option in the variable mapping table for GRIB2 data replaces that so that you can specify each tracer array that you want to read and how you want to deal with missing behaviors because you may want to have a different missing behavior for ozone versus relative humidity. Next slide. 
So your output files, as I mentioned before, you have a single atmospheric file for the initial time, a single surface file for the initial time, and uh, a set of boundary conditions for the initial and each subsequent time that you want to, uh, that, that you provide. Uh, for the boundary conditions, as I mentioned, you get the atmospheric variables on the halo plus the blending zone. So if your halo uh, was four and you choose that you want to blend into the domain, your boundary conditions by say seven, then each of your boundary conditions would be 11 wide. It just tags on extra data. None of that blending um, processing is actually done in change rows cube. It's just providing extra data. And of course, uh, as in WERF, there's four entries for each variable, variable type for the north, south, east, and west edges of your domain. Next slide. So when we're processing this data, the atmospheric and the surface processing and NST, if you're not using GRIB2 fields, are all independent. Uh, they can be done in separate calls. You can use the nameless options to allow the user to determine um, whether to process. You can process atmospheric on its own. You can process surface on its own. You can process atmospheric and surface. You could ask for only initial conditions. You could ask for only boundary conditions. You could ask for literally all of it at once. Usually for your initial time, you want all of it. You could get your atmospheric and your surface initial conditions and your boundary condition at that first time period. All of those options are automatically handled in the app workflow, so you don't have to mess with all of that. But if you were doing it yourself, suppose you wanted your initial conditions from one model, but your boundary conditions from another model, and you wanted to specify those separately, you could use these options to choose that. There's a convert atmosphere, convert surface, and convert NST nameless settings set to true or false to control this. Uh, the regional entry is set to one or two, depending on whether you want boundary conditions or not. And as long as convert atmosphere is set to true, of course. Uh, and as I mentioned before, down at the bottom, the, the app runs change res through loops and sets all of these appropriately. So you don't have to, to do it yourself. Change res um, does all of that on its own, or uh, the app does all of that on its own. Sorry. Yeah, it's fine. Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> Um, so the, how, how is this data processed? Uh, we horizontally interpolate from external model data to the FD3 model grids. We, uh, the surface pressure is adjusted for terrain differences. So suppose your input model data is, uh, you know, really coarse GFS data and you're interpolating to uh, a really fine uh, domain, a three kilometer domain, you're gonna have some pretty significant differences perhaps in the terrain especially over complicated terrain like in the Cascades or the Himalayas. So the surface pressure is adjusted for those differences. It reads in the vertical coordinate definition file that you defined in the nameless input and com uh, computes the 3D pressure so that it can then um, interpolate to that pressure value. Note that uh, a couple of microphysics schemes are supported by the app specifically Thompson, GFDL, and Zhao, I'm not sure how to say that, Zhao Car, but the um, change rows cube on its own, using that variable mapping table that I mentioned, can process whatever tracers you tell it to. It doesn't matter whether, whether that tracer is in your microphysics scheme or not. These are supported through the app, but change rows can, if you make up some new tracer, if you, if you have a, some new, um, microphysics variable, some new hail variable or something. Change rows can process it. It doesn't matter what it is. Um, and also for Thompson, the Thompson is aerosol aware in FD3. And so if you would like to provide it with aerosols and your input data does not have that, we do, there is an option in the name list to process uh, those aerosols. Um, I believe on the uh, NOAA system, Systems, uh, the data that it needs to process those climatological files um, exist for use. And I, I'm sure those are available for download uh, from external users as well. Next slide. Did I freeze? <laughs> 
can you see the rest yeah. of it's yeah. no it didn't it didn't it didn't advance for me really oh wait okay. yes it did sorry it looked the same my <laughs> okay okay um so the uh the surface data processing assumes NOAA lsm it makes some assumptions about soil moisture and soil type and how it handles those things um it's relatively minute but it is important um, so if you're using something other than NOAA LSM, you might get some small inconsistencies, uh, but we're, we're, we're going with that for now, even if you do use uh, the RUC LSM. Uh, again, it, it uses the static surface climatological files that you created in the previous step. George mentioned that there was an option to override these climatological files. This exists for vegetation type, soil type, vegetation fraction. Um, we did this option because as uh, June mentioned, the variable or that the climatological fields are in some cases really coarse and you might want a much finer resolution to read in from say your herd data that contains all of these fields that you need. So you would prefer to read in that data for the time being until we can get some more high resolution data sets, or you want to do a, an exact comparison of near surface variables between, say, WARF and FV3, and you want them to have the same exact surface conditions or uh, uh, land surface state. So you can set these from climo name list options to false so that the data from the input model data will override your climatological fields. You will still need to set those, you, you'll still need to provide the climatological fields from uh, makes from the surface climogen files, but they will be overwritten. So they still need to be in the directory that you point to. Um, but do be careful. Uh, I believe this was mentioned yesterday, the FH psych option in the weather model. It, in, the, in the app, it's set to zero, which means that it does not read in its own climatological fields to phase in. Uh, so if you really want to keep your surface state exactly the way you set it, say um, you, you, you choose to set soil type and vegetation type from your input data and you don't want FV3, the weather model, to change that, then you will need to make sure you have FH psych set to zero. Otherwise, all that work you did to get your surf, your land surface state into the, the, the state that you wanted it to will be overwritten by, by the weather model. Um, so, uh, again, just like the surface, the, the surface climogen field, we interpolate the surface fields to the FE3 grid and we account for land mask differences. Um, we adjust soil temperature for terrain differences, just like surface pressure. It does take into account whether your soil should be frozen or not. If, if your input data does not have frozen soil moisture, then it just takes soil temperature into account and computes from some assumptions how much it how much frozen soil moisture you should have. Um, one of the important uh, things that does also is it rescales soil moisture for soil type differences. So suppose your old soil moisture in your model data was um, a soil type that could hold a lot of water. And then you, in your target data, that point is some soil type that can't hold a whole lot of water. So it does make those adjustments. So soil type in the input data and the target data are really important. You definitely want to make sure that your input data does have soil type, because I know that there are some GRIB2 files out there that don't contain soil type, particularly her data. So we do offer some options in the app to, to deal with that. So soil type in your input data is, is a must. Next slide. Code structure, this should look really similar to what George described for surface climogen. That's because George was the original author of Change Res Cube and he wrote most of the most of the backbone of the code that uh, we have just gone in and modified. So you have the main driver, um, the program setup, reads a name list, does a lot of housekeeping, um, sets up the program execution, model grid, creates ESMF grid objects for both the input data and the output data. So if you wanted to modify that, that's where you'd look. Static data reads in those surface climatological fields that were generated in Make Surface Climo and interpolates in time. 
uh, George talked about. Uh, then uh, it also write data, writes out the files. Input data is where it, it's probably the largest file we have that reads in all of the various different um, file types that you might find because each uh, GRIB2 is different from NetCF is different from NEMS.io. So we have lots of different routines in there that read the various file types. Uh, the, the other more really important one would be Surface. We've made a lot of uh, modifications to Surface to provide those new um, options to override the Surface climatol climatological fields. Um, so there's there's a lot of uh, surf there's a lot of uh, ESMF processing that goes on in Surface as well. Next slide. So this is just general. Uh, if you wish to. Uh, actually, Jeff, you can go ahead and take this if you want, since you're kind of doing the overview. This has moved on from changes okay. to just UFS util stuff. <laughs> okay, that's we'll start fine. End with uh, you. Bookend, bookend for Jeff. All right. Yeah, maybe we, maybe I should have put this up at the top um, with the other general uh, information slide. But anyway, the, for for anyone who's interested in contributing to code and UFS utils, uh, we've set up uh, a process where developers um, can check out the code. Uh, make iterations, create their own branch um, and their own fork of the repository, and then open PRs back into the authoritative UFS utils repository. Um, and there, we welcome any developers who wish to do that. Uh, we are following Git flow protocols, though, so you need to create a feature branch off of develop, which is the latest um, code in UFS utils, and then make sure that fork and, and your feature branch stay up to date with the develop branch and the authoritative repo. Um, uh, let's see, bug fixes and changes that support uh, current or future NSF operations will be given priority. Yes, that's that's true. So um, if there is something urgent that needs to go in, that, that obviously is going to get priority for, for operations. Uh, but prior, prior to the code merges, uh, we have a requirement to create a unit test uh for whatever development that you're producing uh and that needs to be included in the pr it's it's run automatically um, by github once you open the pr and it must pass and then we also have a series of regression tests that uh, need to be run um on all the NOAA officially supported machines which are listed there um and and those just make sure that any of the previous existing code doesn't change uh or if it if it shouldn't change, if it should change, then uh, then we update the baselines for the regression tests, um, and those are run uh, nightly. But uh, for PRs, they should also be run manually by the developer who is opening the PR. So, anyway, uh, all of your contributions are welcome. So please feel free to um, work on any development that you feel or you have time to work on, and you can look at uh, the wiki page here again. I shared that in the initial opening slide. Um, but for more information on the repository and uh, the code development and, and Git flow protocols that we have for UFS utils, you can find all that information on that uh, uh, website there. So and I'll with just that, if, oh yeah, I'll just sorry interrupt to say if all of that uh, none of that makes any sense to you, but you're still uh, interested and excited about developing, as I hope everybody is, there will be a talk specifically about. Um, code development and how to get your changes back into the app on Thursday. Thanks, Mike. We should have referenced that in that slide. That's great. Um, and yeah, for documentation purposes, um, we have a link here in this slide um, specifically for information related to the release. So there's detailed information on each of the utilities uh, listed on that website. And that's the last slide. I, I believe that one points uh, for some reason explicitly to change res cube, but all of the, if you just scroll up to the top, that will have all the information. Okay. There was one question here I was hoping you could answer, uh, Larissa from Ting Lee. He asks in the regional runs, what is the definition of surface pressure generated from change res cube? Is it dry mass plus moisture or mass pressure, including contributions from hydrometeors? I think it's dry mass uh, I, plus moisture, but I, I, I'm not 100% I, sure. George might, I believe George is the one, I'm, he, I don't think he wrote it, but he 
pulled in the code originally to do that? He might know. George, do you have any idea? Yeah, uh, Ting, I know you, you emailed me about that back in March and there was a very long email chain of discussion. So um, why don't, can we take this offline? Okay, so he said, okay, thanks. <laughs> um, another question from June. Uh, do you mean that ICs need to be gen regenerated using ChangeRest Cube if RUC LSM is employed? I don't think it is, um, is supported for now, but some people may employ them in the future using CCPP. Well, RUC LSM is supported. It's in a number of the sweet definition files. I'm not sure if I understand the question. Do you mean that I, I think ICs she's talking? I think she's 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 talking about how uh, it does make some assumptions in some of the surface field computations. Oh. Um, remember that are specific to NOAA LSM. So in the future, if we if we do provide, because we we've talked about this, I remember I know over email we've had discussions with Tanya in the past about. Uh, changing some of those small assumptions that Change Res Cube makes about processing it the way NOAA LSM would process th certain things. Yep. So if yep. we do into if we do provide, you know, an if statement somewhere where if if you're going to be using it with REC LSM, then it would do something differently, then you would probably at least need to reprocess just the initial condition surface fields. So you wouldn't have to, it shouldn't do, it wouldn't do anything for the atmospheric component or the boundary conditions. Um, so yes, June, if you if we do ever if we do ever implement that, it would be a it would probably be a nameless option or something that the user would choose, and that would do something slightly different. I don't expect it to make massive massive differences, um, but if you're looking to reproduce something, then you would probably want to to keep in in kind with that. Right. Yeah, I remember those emails. And I know we have the details from Tanya. It's just a matter of time and priority to get that in. So yeah. Um, yeah. OK. And there is a hand up uh, in the chat. Uh, Gili, did you want to ask your question? For, uh, so I'm still curious about the the Halo. Uh, I, can under I can understand the Halo 4 and Halo 6, but I'm still curious what a Halo 3, 4, which program you use it for what purpose? So the driver script has Halo 5 instead of Halo 3. So I'm just one. So, right, just here. So, Halo 3, uh, I don't know which program you use it. So, the, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's one of the files required by the F3 executable. I can't speak to why it needs 3 and 4, um, but that's the way that, uh, you know, originally it was set up, and that's the way that we've continued um, creating the preprocessing files. So I yeah, I, I, yeah, go ahead, Gerard. Yes, so if you run it in global mode, all it needs is uh, three cells outside of the boundary of a given tile to get information from the, the tile next to it. Um, so that was, that was the code as, as it was before all the changes to make it enable running in regional mode were put in. When that was put in, they didn't want to change the global code the regional code needs four cells. Um, so for that reason, it, there are two different files. So they could have combined it so that it always gets the four, you know, the four cell halo file. Uh, but they decided to keep the two portions of the code separate. So the regional portion of the code will look for a, a, f a four cell halo file. Whereas the, the remaining portion of the code will look for the three uh, cell halo. I'm sorry, so, uh, so Gerardo, so do you mean like right now it's only use Halo 4 or 
Okay, uh, Jili and Gerard, I, in, term, in terms of time interest, I will suggest you guys to have this discussion through the Slack, which everyone can see because uh, our next topic, we have a very interesting topic, FE3 DICO overview. And uh, we, we, we do need to keep going on if uh, we want to stick with our schedule roughly. <laughs> so sure, no okay, it's all great Sorry talk, great discussion. Please uh, go to Slack and uh, there actually continue <laughs> this, this discussion. Can we? Okay, I already said actually our next talk is from Lucas Harris. He is uh, from, uh, uh, he is actually F3 team lead there in GFDL. Okay. Okay. It's, uh, are you ready, <laughs> Lucas? Yes. Can I share my screen? Yeah, please share your screen and uh, go ahead. Okay, just a second. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay, can everybody see that? Yes, it looks good, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, good morning or good afternoon, everybody, as it may be. Um, so I'm gonna discuss the uh, FE3 Dynamical Core, how it's set up, how it's designed, and uh, some of the options that are used within the Dynamical Core. Um, I wanna acknowledge the uh, FE3 team that I work with and the uh, Modeling Systems Division here at GFPL, the Computer Engineering and Computational Science Program. Uh, also, I wanna acknowledge our community partners at, especially at uh, EMC, at AOML, and at NASA Goddard, and at Vulcan and at uh, the Chinese Academy of Sciences, and especially uh, S.J. Lin, uh, FE3's creator, who uh, retired from the Federal Service in 2019. So FE3 is a very, is, it's, it's a large dynamical core. It's used for a lot of different purposes. It's very configurable and I only have 50 minutes. So I can't go through everything about it and all of its use cases. Um, but however, we do have an ex exhaustive uh, documentation website shown here. Uh, the link is also available on the GitHub that I'll discuss in the next page. Um, and uh, also uh, we have the uh, FE3 documentation, which was released earlier this year, a comprehensive uh, scientific documentation that describes how it's put together and why. Um, there's much more information here than I can go into in the next 50 minutes. Uh, so if you need more information, uh, go ahead and uh, take a look at these sources. I'm going to periodically reference the documentation and uh, the literature during this talk. I also want to mention the uh, community uh, official GitHub for FE3 uh, at uh, GFDL Atmos Cube Sphere under the NOAA GFDL uh, 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 institution. Uh, this is, we're setting this up as a uh, community hub uh, for releases, issue tracking, uh, bug fixes, documentation. Uh, we've also been publishing some example notebooks as some basic test cases. Uh, we just update, released some new updates the other day. Um, we're hoping to be able to expand this capability in the future. Um, we also want to be able to improve our uh, to improve uh, this to make it a center for all the community activity around uh, FE3 to include you know, things like automatic automated testing, uh, CICD, and buzzwordies as well as to include more examples and a number of other uh, community engagement features. So what exactly is FE3? So uh, FE3 is a GFDL finite volume cube sphere dynamical core. And it got its start as the uh, uh, chemistry transport module in a, or excuse me, as the transport module in a chemistry transport model back at NASA Goddard in the early 90s uh, through the uh, finite volume advection scheme. And to that point, nobody had really applied finite volume methods from uh, aeronautical and mechanical engineering in atmospheric science. Uh, but when this was implemented within the chemistry module, it made such a big improvement on the chemistry simulations that led to a revolution in that field. And still, uh, that scheme, the Lin and Rood scheme, dominates uh, chemistry modeling, especially global chemistry modeling. But uh, S.J. Lin didn't stop there. He then developed a full shallow water solver uh, that emphasized uh, nonlinear vorticity dynamics for reasons I'll discuss later. And beyond that, uh, he introduced a, uh, a finite volume uh, pressure gradient force and the innovative uh, Lagrangian vertical coordinate creating the three-dimensional FV, the Latlon FV hydrostatic dynamical core, which itself is extremely successful for uh, global modeling at a number of different centers. Beyond that, it was extended to the cube sphere and other irregular grids. Uh, not hydrostatic dynamics was introduced, uh, variable resolution and variable resolution methods to get to the current uh, status of FE3 today, in which it has a lot of different features for simulations across a very wide range of uh, resolutions and a wide range of use cases. But in all cases, the same, uh, the same set of uh, principles, what we call the FE3 way, has always been 
adhered to. Always keeping an eye towards physical consistency, that you're not discretized, you're not trying to solve a some um, infinitesimal partial differential equation. You're really solving the finite volume integrated forms of the laws of physics. Uh, to that end, also the, the numerics are fully finite volume to the extent possible. Uh, FV3 is always put together with an eye towards component coupling to both physics and to the other components of the Earth system, particularly uh, chemistry, land surface, and the ocean. And also always, uh, to the extent possible without compromising the scientific integrity of the algorithm, is that FV3 is made to be as fast as it can, and in particular to take advantage of the architecture of modern microprocessors and the way that supercomputers are set up. And all these together have made for a very successful dynamical core that's in use at many centers, both here in the United States and around the world. So uh, what exactly is a finite volume mean? And uh, finite volume numerics is a different way of thinking than the traditional finite differencing or the pseudospectral methods that dominated in the 20th century. And uh, finite volume methods are one of the two major uh, ways in the 21st century for uh, computational fluid dynamics. Uh, the other is the uh, finite element methods. It's used by the very nice uh, spectral element dynamical core being developed by uh, the Navy and by the Department of Energy. Uh, in a finite volume dynamical core, uh, all variables are three-dimensional cell means or two-dimensional face means. There's no concept of grid point values within this dynamical core. And furthermore, uh, we don't solve the differential Euler equations, which is the familiar way that we see these things, but instead we we solve their cell integrated forms, which are actually the ways the original laws of physics are integrate are, are uh, expressed. And in fact, if you remember back to your fluid dynamics courses, is uh, typically to form those equations, what you do is you form a finite volume formulation, and then you take the limit in, in as the volume goes to zero. In fact, you'll see this a lot in uh, Holton's chapter two. So we basically skip that last step and solve that cell integrated form using the various integral theorems from vector calculus. So. And this has a lot of different advantages. Uh, everything is a flux, including everything in the momentum equation. Uh, this conserves mass to rounding error, as well as uh, gives it some other conservation properties. Uh, in FV3, we're using the CD grid. I'll explain what that is, which gives us an exact computation for vertical vorticity, as well as an accurate computation of divergence. Uh, it recovers a lot of uh, the physical properties of the original equations, particularly Newton's third law. Uh, this is a fully compressible, uh, fully compressible set of equations in both the hydrostatic and non-hydrostatic equations. So the calculation is horizontally local. And we also use the innovative uh, flow following Lagrangian vertical coordinate that I'll discuss more in detail uh, later. Uh, 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 FE3 is a, uh, a fully forward in time solver with backwards pressure gradient force in acoustic terms. And I'll mention exactly what that means in the, in the following slides. Uh, one thing I want to point out is, uh, uh, is uh, I have a couple of points here again within this uh, presentation where I'm referencing specific, specific literature or specific sections in the documentation. So, for example, this is all explain, explained in uh, section 1.2 of the FV3 documentation. So, the first thing I'm going to talk about is the time integration sequence. Um, and, and this is actually one of those things that tends to get buried, buried under a lot of different details, but it is important to be able to think about this because it does explain a lot about how FE3 is constructed. Uh, FE3 is designed as a forward in time solver, a single time step forward uh, with multiple levels of time integration. Uh, and, and the reason why we adopted a forward in time method for most of the equations is that it's uh, consistent with the physical formulation of the equations. It preserves the hyperbolic form of the Euler equations, the wave propagation form, and it also preserves causality, which is a very important physical principle that, that things are, that you can trace definite cause to events by tracing backwards in time a certain uh, characteristic of the flow. Uh, the, uh, most of the terms in FE3 are advanced forward in time, so in particular the flux divergence terms and the physics tendencies, uh, but for stability, uh, some of the terms are, are advanced backwards in time, like the pressure gradient force and the sound wave terms. So this is what we call a heavy form uh, in particular. Excuse me. Uh, the FE3 is what we call a heavy solver. And that means horizontally explicit, vertically implicit. So even the backwards in time, time forms, those are all still explicit in the horizontal, but all of, everything is implicit within the vertical. Uh, vertical advection, vertical sound wave processes, vertical pressure gradient force, and so on. And again, I want to mention the Lagrangian vertical coordinate, which uh, 
really encapsulates a lot about how FE3 is designed and also one of its big reasons for success. And uh, that means that flow is constrained along time evolving Lagrangian surfaces is essentially a flow following uh, vertical coordinate. I'll get more into what exactly this means a little bit later, but I do want to mention at this point that it does greatly simplify the innermost, the acoustic or Lagrangian dynamics time step of FE3. In particular, it means that we don't need to explicitly compute ver most of the vertical processes within the innermost loop, which saves a lot of computation time. Uh, so here's the three levels of time integration. Um, I don't want to go through this in complete detail, but I do just want to show what exactly is going on here. We have the three levels, which is the outermost physics time step. You advance the dynamics by a DT Atmos, you call the physics, and then you apply the physics through a uh, API that FE3 applies. So the tendencies can be applied in a manner that's consistent with the dynamics. And this dynamics consistency for initial conditions, for diabetic forcing, for uh, boundary conditions, and for data assimilation, this is all important for getting the best possible results out of any uh, FE3-based model. There is a uh, first inner loop, which is the vertical remapping loop. You advance your uh, forward dynamics forward a number of time steps. Uh, you call the you, you then call the subcycle tracer transport, which uh, the traces can be evicted at a longer time step than the uh, gravity wave and acoustic wave steps. And then you can do a vertical remapping back onto the uh, reference Eulerian coordinate, right? which is going to be necessary for the physics and to avoid preventing the layers from becoming infinitesimally thin. And then you have your innermost acoustic time step, which is the CD grid solver, uh, the, vertically, uh, the, the vertical sound wave processes and the pressure gradient forces. Um, again, this is all described in great detail in chapter two, uh, but this is going to give you a basic idea of how the code is laid out the way that it is and how to configure the solver to be able to get the right time step for all of your processes. So, I'm going to have a couple of different slides like this that show the different options available within FE3. Um, this right here, these are the uh, nameless options for the timeless option for the time integration. I don't want to go through this again in great detail. I've only got 50 minutes, but uh, I do want to mention two things. One is DT Atmos, uh, which is usually in a different nameless than the usual FE core and ML that FE3 is configured in. Uh, you should choose this motivated on your design for your physics. Uh, physics packages assume a certain calling interval when they're designed. Uh, in particular, global packages like uh, the GFS physics, the GFDL, uh, the GFDL climate model physics, they're designed to use a longer time step. Uh, so we use a time step on the uh, about three minutes, somewhere between two and three, two, two and four minutes for most purposes of these resolutions. Regional physics are usually designed to use shorter time steps, so choose that accordingly. Um, another one is the, the value of uh, n split here. This is the number of uh, time steps for acoustic time steps or acoustic acoustic gravity wave time step, I should say. Uh, a, a good value for this between five and 10. Uh, if you, one thing that we find is that if you go beyond 10, what you can do instead is reduce the number of n splits and use a larger number of k splits, vertical remappings, which tends to give you uh, better stability. Also want to mention there's a, a runtime hydrostatic switch as well. There is some debate within the community when exactly uh, hydrostatic dynamics uh, is still valid. Uh, the European Center, for instance, finds that it perfect, it's perfectly good down to 1.5 kilometers. Although we've actually seen improvements due to non-hydrostatic dynamics at resolutions as large as, as, large as 50 kilometers. So uh, I recommend for the SRW app using non-hydrostatic dynamics just because that's what the model is designed for. But you can explore yourself if you'd like. The, I want to briefly describe the CubeSphere grid. Uh, this is more of relevance to global modeling applications. Um, but however, the particulars of the CubeSphere grid are what uh, give a lot of flexibility to the regional domains as well. Uh, FV3 uses a CubeSphere grid uh, in which you project the sphere onto the six faces of the cube, which is where the three in FV3 comes from. It's originally a superscript, but it's hard to type in our email clients. Um, and the big upshot for the for regional applications is that the coordinates are non-orthogonal uh, in this mnemonic cube sphere, which gives us the best regularity. It requires some changes to the solver. Uh, there's a nice elegant way of doing this that Putman and Lynn figured out, uh, which uh, allows us to become, use a non-orthogonal coordinate without uh, causing a lot of problems, without messing up the solver a whole lot. And this gives the advantage in that you're free to choose a lot of very uniform quadrilateral grids on your regional domain if you're not constrained to having a global domain. And in particular, the excellent uh, ESG grid that will be uh, described in the next talk 
uh, takes great advantage of this to produce an extremely regular uh, regional domain over a very large part of the globe. Oh, and one thing I also want to point out, FE3 internally defines the winds and the local coordinate, but the output to the physics, to the DA, to the, uh, and to the history files, that is always Earth relative. It's always zonal meridional winds. So the end user does not need to do any uh, rotation from grid relative to Earth relative winds. There's a number of options that constrain these. Uh, these all need to be set within a, a simulation. Um, one thing I want to point out is that NPX and NPY, a little bit of trickiness with this, those are the number of grid corners in each direction. Uh, so you need to increase that by, so you need to take the number of grid cells and increase it by one to get your number of NPX and NPY. So that's why a global, say, C768 grid, which is 768 by 768 in each of its six tiles, uh, it's given in the nameless as C as 769, 769 instead. Okay. Okay. Uh, does anybody have any uh, questions? Are there any questions in the, in the chat or in Slack that people have before I uh, keep going? Uh, there's no questions so far, so please go ahead. Okay, great. Uh, how much time do I have before the break? Uh, we scheduled a break at uh, 10.30, and there's a 15-minute break, and uh, you have another talk, right, called FS3 right. DICO. So, okay, please go ahead. <laughs> okay, yeah, so okay. Manage your time. Okay, thank you. All right, so... So those are the, those are the basic upshot of the options. Uh, one thing, the other thing I want to point out is the layout, which is the number of uh, MPI domain partitions in each direction in each tile. Um, you should choose the number of uh, cores that are, that are based on your grid and divide evenly into your number of uh, grid cells in each direction. You don't have to make them the same number. Uh, don't make them. You don't have to make them divide divide into your number of grid cells in each direction, but you'll get best performance if you do that. Also, the number, total number of cores should be the product of those two elements of your layout uh, variable. I want to briefly hit the highlights of the uh, FV advection, the uh, famed uh, Lin and Rude scheme, which is extended to the cube sphere on a non orthogonal coordinate by uh, Putman and Lin. And uh, this is the advection scheme uh, that underlies a lot within FV3. Uh, people get really obsessed about advection schemes because they're relatively simple. Um, I don't want to waste a whole lot of time on it because it bores people who aren't dynamical core people, unfortunately. But I do want to just hit the highlights. Uh, in particular, this is, a, uh, uh, this is a very powerful advection scheme. It takes one-dimensional piecewise parabolic method operators or any, uh, any one-dimensional uh, finite volume scheme for that instance. And it's combined in a clever way to get a fully forward in time two-dimensional scheme that has a lot of different advantages. Uh, mass conservation, uh, can con preserve correlations in the monotonic limiter, uh, is a, preserves, a, uh, cancels leading order, order error, uh, you, allows a separate current number limit in X and Y, in particular diagonal flow doesn't give you uh, instabilities. Uh, uh, upwinding preserves hyperbolicity and causality. Um, and altogether, it gives you a very good blend of accuracy and efficiency. It's been hard to beat, and in fact, really hasn't uh, in the 30 years since this was first introduced at NASA Goddard. Um, and I want to point out that virtually everything within the horizontal processes or quasi-horizontal processes within FE3 can be written as an advective flux, the only thing being except the uh, pressure gradient force. And so the advection scheme underlies a lot within FE3, and this actually gives some really nice advantages to our solver that I'll discuss a little bit later again. Um, so this, this is used for both uh, dynamical quantities, things like the uh, mass, uh, vorticity, uh, city, uh, the virtual potential temperature and other th and vertical velocity. So all these different dynamical quantities are invected on the acoustic time step. Uh, we also use a, a longer, an adaptive time step as well to advect the tracers. And the reason for this is because uh, of the design of FV3 and also a fact about the way that the global atmosphere works. Um, some split explicit uh, methods are designed with the assumption that the maximum wind speed is much, much smaller than the speed of sound. It turns out in the real atmosphere, that's not true, especially if you're resolving the stratosphere where the winds can easily get up to be 200 meters a second in the polar night jets. So in FV3, we, advet, uh, we have two levels of time steps. We have the gravity and acoustic wave terms. Those are vected on the smallest time step. Yep. And then we're able to accumulate the mass fluxes and then, and then advect the wind speeds, that the, the tracers themselves on a longer time step because they're constrained not by the sum of the of the sound speed and the effective speed, but just the effective, the wind speed. Uh, 
one other thing I want to point out is uh, that the way that the FE, uh, the FE advection scheme is set up from those one-dimensional operators, I think gives us a lot of flexibility to form our advection to meet different quantities. So uh, different shape preserv preservation quantities, uh, preserving correlations. Uh, the latest is our uh, positive definite tracer advection scheme, which has a lot of advantages. One of the big ones being that it improves uh, hurricane structure an awful lot. Uh, so Kuhn Gao just published an excellent paper on this. It should appear in JS soon. Uh, so briefly, I want to go over the uh, nameless options. Uh, there's a number of different uh, advection schemes within FV3. Uh, there's 5, 6, 8, 10, and minus 5. Uh, if these all have different advantages and, uh, and uh, compensate, compensations to them. Uh, you can configure them for different uh, dynamical terms. However, we strongly recommend that the uh, kinetic energy gradient, vorticity, W, and theta all use the same scheme to enforce uh, a consistent advection of all of those quantities. And further, we recommend that, uh, furthermore, uh, actually can't recommend, but we insist, in fact, if you don't do this, your uh, simulations get messed up. You, to advect tracers, HORDTR, you must use either a monotonic scheme, which is a little bit more diffusive, or a positive definite scheme to advect those schemes. And that's because, uh, especially if you're running chemistry, you don't want to put negative values under your schemes. So uh, there's a couple of different options that are floating around. Uh, and, and your choice of options depend a lot on what particular uh, situations you're running. Uh, most people are using the SRW application. You're going to be running at resolutions between 25 kilometers and 500 meters. Here are our recommendations for uh, advection schemes. So for the dynamical quantities, you can use a, a scheme which is not, which is uh, what we call unlimited, in which there is no limiter that's being applied to that. There's no monotonicity, no positive definite, because these aren't positive definite schemes. And we have two settings that we recommend. One is a virtually inviscid number five, which has very little, almost no implicit diffusion within it. And this gives you a very good uh, small scale structure is perhaps the best for short term forecasting. Uh, but one thing that we have found is that actually it can make uh, convection develop very quickly. Um, so it tends to not preserve the large scale conditions very well. So for longer term forecasting, you might recommend the minimally diffusive scheme number six here, which is more diffusive. Uh, but it does give a better large scale skill. And this is important for things like tropical cyclones, especially when you're running on a very large domain in which you're resolving convection. Um, and remember, uh, one of the nice things about global models that parameterize convection is that you can tune your convection scheme. Well, if you're resolving convection explicitly, or not, not resolving, but if you have some explicit representation of convection, well, you can't tune that. Uh, so you need to be very careful about how your advection scheme is put, up, put together to be able to maintain your large scale skill. We find that scheme six does a great job at this. We're looking into how we can make scheme five work the best for both situations. That's a uh, subject for future research. I also want to recommend uh, a positive definite scheme numbered minus five for weather prediction. This only works in the most recent two releases of uh, FE3. However, this does give you some very nice results. Uh, for chemistry applications, however, eight and 10 preserve correlations exactly in the horizontal. So those might be uh, preferable if you're more interested in chemistry than storm structure. Okay. Um, so is it about time for a break? Actually, you started 10 minutes later, so <laughs> we will okay. have a short break. Please go ahead and finish your talk. Thank you. Okay, so I've got three more slides before the uh, break, before uh, I have a break in my talk. So I'll briefly discuss the, uh, the, horizontal, the horizontal solver and how it's formulated. So Lagrangian dynamics within FE3, um, this is this kind of, it's a different way of uh, thinking about uh, the, formulation of the, uh, of the Euler equations that govern fluid motion. Uh, it sounds intimidating, but in reality, it's not. And in fact, it does simplify your solver an awful lot. Uh, basically, what we do is we apply a vertical coordinate transformation to eliminate all the vertical uh, convection terms in our equations. Uh, and what this allows us to do is that it allows us to treat the atmosphere as a, as a set of layers that have impermeable, impermeable membranes between them. There's no flow across those, those Lagrangian interfaces. And then as a flow evolves, the surfaces float up and down, conforming to the flow, conforming to the convergence and divergence within each grid cell, uh, conforming to the expansion due to uh, localized heating, expansion and contraction. And that is what represents your vertical motion. That deformation is the representation of vertical motion. And that in, in addition to the vertical pressure gradient force in the non-hydrostatic solver. And that means that we can, we can represent vertical motion or vertical advection for free
in the solver. We don't need an explicit calculation of those. those. And this greatly simplifies the amount of calculations we need to do within the dynamical core. Now I should point out that the one down the, the one trade-off there, not really a downside, is that you need you to treat your you need to introduce two new equations for uh, solving for the thickness delta p and your geometric thickness uh, delta z to be your prognostic variables. So you need to do you do need to solve for those explicitly within the Lagrangian system. However, I think that's an acceptable trade-off, especially when you're talking about advecting lots of different tracer species or doing very high resolution simulations. Uh, these are the prognostic variables within FV3. There's the six prognostic variables, including two exclusively defined for the non-hydrostatic solver. Uh, there's the total air mass. In FV3, total air mass includes the water vapor and all the condensates. Uh, this is a lot different from a lot of other dynamical cores. So in particular, when you're ingesting old GFS data, you need to be careful to make sure you're transforming that correctly. Uh, we, uh, one of the prognostic variables, again, is virtual potential temperature which is a conserved variable in adiabatic flow, uh, the, the B-grid winds, the vertical velocities, uh, the geometric layer depth, as well as a host, host of uh, passive tracers. All the other variables are diagnostic quantities in the model, including specific heat, uh, which in our non-hydrostatic solver is used as a, uh, which is diagnosed. We have a variable uh, uh, specific, specific heat content. One thing I do want to point out is that in FV3, all variables are layer means in the vertical, uh, uh, the same way that they're defined in most uh, computational fluid dynamics codes. We have no vertical staggering in FV3 because the Lagrangian vertical coordinate makes it unnecessary. Okay, so uh, last couple of slides before the talk, before the break. So one thing that F allows us, the, one of the things we've done when, we, when uh, FV3 was designed was to emphasize vorticity dynamics. And one thing that's obvious to anybody who looks at fluids for any, days, any amount of time is that they're very strongly vortis vortical at all scales from the scale of, uh, uh, in this case, this is a uh, sketch by Leonardo da Vinci of an old man taking a look at uh, water swirling out of a drain, or uh, this very large example, the uh, atmosphere of Jupiter, or you can see that vorticial motions are everywhere within fluids. And not to mention, these are the, these are the features within fluids that persist. So these are the things that allow us to predict motions within fluids. And in particular, the reasons, one of the reasons why supercell thunderstorms and their tornadoes are, predict, are not really predictable, but you can if, issue a 30 minute tornado warning is that those vortical features in the atmosphere persist long enough that you can get a warning out. They usually don't come out of the blue. And in fact, our forecasters have done a fantastic job taking advantage of that fact to the point where, yeah, where, where fatalities from tornadoes have plunged to very tiny levels in the last couple of decades. Uh, FE3's discretization, uh, again, it emphasizes this, this basic fact, this kind of obvious fact about the atmosphere. Uh, they, if they influence our choice of the, uh, of the governing equations, our discretization, our grid staggering, and uh, also how we formulated all, all the variables be advected rather than just, uh, rather than just solved in a traditional sense. Oh, one, one other thing I want to point out about the uh, Great Red Spot here is that uh, one of the first people to work out the dynamics of the Jovian atmosphere was, in fact, the late Gareth Williams, who worked in W Division, in my division here at GFDL. I, I really kind of regret I never got the chance to meet him, but he's very instrumental in, in figuring out a lot of the dynamics of the atmosphere of Jupiter. Uh, so the momentum equation, which is the, the nonlinear flux form vector invariant equations. And we choose this because a lot of these terms here, you see the absolute vorticity, kinetic energy, divergence, pressure, uh, these are all scalars. And scalars are all invariant in your coordinates. So you can do a coordinate transformation, which is what you do when you go from point to point in the cube sphere. And the scalars stay the same. So you don't need to worry about how the, tr the coordinates transform when you do this. One of the terms is the absolute vorticity flux here, omega v and minus omega u. I might have the science backwards on that. I, I have to apologize if I got that backwards. Um, and so the question is, how do you compute the vorticity? And by using the d-grid in, uh, the, 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 in which the velocities are defined on cell faces and tangential to the cell faces, that you can use Stokes' theorem to calculate the cell mean vorticity exactly. There is no averaging involved. And because the because all of our other variables, uh, the, the mass, the temperature, vertical velocity, those are cell average quantities. These, those are all invected the same way as is the cell integrated vorticity due to the form of our uh, discretization. So one of the nice things about a discretization is that if two variables are invected the same way, so is their product. And this includes things like potential vorticity and the updraft helicity. 
And that's a very important thing for uh, severe storms forecasting and also for hurricane forecasting. So you can see an example here from my uh, 2019 paper in which you see uh, updraft, hourly maximum updraft list. You can see individual grid cell tracks that are very well defined at very fine scales over the course of a whole hour. And this shows one of the very great strengths of FV3 is that that updraft helicity is invected as a scalar. So there's no errors when you invect that beyond what you have in the original quantities. This allows us to get excellent representations of rotating supercell thunderstorms as well as their, uh, as well as their ro rotating updrafts. You can see there on the right. Uh, the uh, CD, yeah, so the, the CD grid solver, this is a method that's borrowed from the idea of Riemann solvers in uh, computational fluid dynamics. So virtually all CFD solvers are unstaggered used in engineering. And they use a Riemann solver as a way to get the fluxes at a very high degree ac of accuracy without needing to worry about grid staggering. Uh, we do something similar here within FV3. To be able to evaluate our fluxes consistently, we need face normal and time mean fluxes over a time step. So the way that we do that is that we interpolate the D-grid winds onto the C-grid. And those interpolated winds are inaccurate. So what you need to do is you advance them by a half time step using the solver, a corrector time step. And those give you a very accurate estimate of the C-grid winds to be able to compute all the different fluxes. And uh, this is a very powerful method that allows us to be able to maintain the excellent vorticity of the, uh, advection properties while getting a very accurate computation of the flux divergence. Uh, furthermore, this is all the computed upstream as per the piecewise parabolic method in the, uh, in the FV advection scheme. Uh, this allows consistent computation of a lot of terms, including the uh, kinetic energy term here you see here, which can be expressed as a flux. And this avoids the hollingsworth kahlberg instability, which is a nasty instability that sometimes pops up uh, in some solvers that use the vector invariant equations, but they don't treat the terms consistently. And so all this together, uh, the two-grid discretization, the time-centered upwind fluxes, this all acts very effectively to give uh, a solver which has very little computational modes within it. And this allows us to uh, run FV3 with very high accuracy uh, and with very little noise, which reduces the amount of dissipation we need to apply. So I'll talk about a little bit more later. Uh, and the last thing I want to talk about uh, before, or actually, I think, actually, yes, that was the last thing I want to talk about before the break. So why don't we take a, a do you think it's time to take a 15 minute break, and then I can finish, uh, go through the rest of the talk? <laughs> well, this is my, I mean, I should point out that I have two, two the, I, yeah, this is, this is my one talk. I've, this is two parts of one talk. So if this is the last slide, right? <laughs> this is the last, this is, this is the last slide of the first part of my talk. The rest of my presentation is the second part of the talk, which is the extra half hour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you finish your first one? Because then we have a very short break. <laughs> oh, so you just want I, to I go think on. you need a break, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, need, you need to finish well, the first I, part of the talk. This is the first part. This is the finish of my first talk, part of my talk. OK, great. So I think that's a great point for uh, take a short break. And uh, we. Yeah, I think we can take two minutes break, but uh, there is a question from the Slack. Uh, do you, maybe it's, we, we, maybe you can answer this question very, very quickly. Okay, <laughs> it's from John that, yeah. Is this positive definite advection scheme available at the first public release of SRW app thought <laughs> Short range weather app. So that positive uh, definite advection scheme you talk about in your slide. Uh, the first, the first app is released in March two thousand twenty one. Yeah. So if it includes, if it incorporates the uh, the twenty, the see here, the update of FE three that was released in uh, February of twenty twenty one, then it should have the positive definite advection scheme. Okay, uh, there's a second part of question actually. Do you also have a recommend, rec recommended actual advection setups for high resolution simulation with uh, short, weather, short range weather app, like 10 kilometer? So it's basically <laughs> what, rec what your recommendation for the advection setups for 10 kilometer also application? Okay, so uh, that, what I'd recommend for 10 kilometers is indeed uh, what I showed earlier. So, and in fact, I can give you the idea, an idea of what we use for the GFS. Let me share, let me share that screen. Um, so here, this should be the right one. Okay. Um, 
So uh, what we use in the GFS is that we're using uh, HORD MT VTD MDP of five. And uh, right now I believe HORD TR of eight is being used because the last upgrade was before the release of the positive to definite scheme. Um, so that does a very good job, especially with tropical cyclone intensity. Uh, we get a little bit better large scale skill with HORD six. It's actually very, very similar to GFS version 15 testing. Um, and it may not exist at all in uh, GFS version 16. So for 10 kilometers, I think five and either eight or minus five, if minus five is available to you is the best. So for example, in 13 kilometer shield, we're using five and minus five. Okay. Does that okay, great. Okay. <laughs> yeah, great. Thank you, actually. Yeah, thanks for very actually rich talk with lots of helpful information. I think we do need a break for you and everyone. <laughs> Let's take five minutes break and we can come back at uh, basically 10.50 mountain time. So Lucas, you can continue talk actually okay. uh, in five minutes. Thank you. In five minutes, sure. Thank in you. In five minutes. Thank you. Right, yes. Thank you. Hi Ming, on the uh, on the spreadsheet, I'm listed as uh, the uh, facilitator yeah. for this presentation, but I don't know if you yeah. want to continue and we can just swap from you after this. Okay, let's continue. Thank you, Mike. Mm -hmm. Hey, Lucas, are you ready? <laughs> can you show your screen, share your screen? Sure. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay, okay. That? great, thank you, please go ahead. Okay, thank you, Ming. Okay, so I uh, wanted to finish up about the uh, hor quasi-horizontal processes within, uh, within FE3. And the next one is the uh, pressure gradient force, the finite volume pressure gradient force. And one thing that, uh, if you take a look at the uh, pressure gradient force formulation, it looks like it should be very easy to discretize using just the two point, uh, just the two point, I mean, finite differencing formula. And indeed, a lot, of, a lot of dynamical cores do that. Well, the problem is, is that that's not such a great idea because you're taking the small difference of two very large terms. And that's a very uh, good rule for uh, inaccuracy. And plus, it doesn't reproduce any of the physical features of, of the real atmosphere, uh, any of Newton's laws, nor the uh, integral theorems that are used to describe the atmosphere. What uh, S.J. Lin's idea was to go back to basics and go back to a finite volume formulation of the atmosphere and then use those laws and the integral theorems to compute a, a pressure gradient force formulation. And uh, this has actually been a very, and uh, this actually produced a very nice result that the errors are lower with much less noise compared to traditional formulations of the pressure gradient force. Uh, this also has a couple of nice features. One is that it's purely horizontal. There is no uh, spurious projection along coordinates. Uh, the pressure gradient force, it's equal and opposite on facing, uh, facing grid cells. In fact, this is uh, recovering that uh, same quantity, not just the same idea of finite volume fluxes, in this case, it's kind of like a momentum flux, but it also recovers the Newton's third law of motion. And furthermore, it's also curl free in the absence of density gradient. So it doesn't create any false vorticity, which is another important thing you want to be able to do. Of course, now you have density variations, you get barrel clinic vorticity generation, which is why we simulate supercell thunderstorms. Uh, but uh, it does not create vorticity where it should not be creating vorticity. And that's a key point. So. Uh, the vertical levels within FV3. So FV3 could, in theory, use any vertical coordinate you would like as its reference uh, coordinate, well, when you, what you get when you remap back onto your uh, Eulerian reference levels. Uh, but most of the time, we use uh, a hybrid pressure coordinate within FV3 that's defined as AK and BK. Uh, one thing I want to point about FV3, which is true for most pressure coordinate uh, dynamical cores, is that the top is K equals 1. Uh, which is a little bit of a shock to those of us who are coming from a Z coordinate world like my, myself when I was doing, when I was in grad school. But yeah, but this is a common practice within uh, 
pressure coordinate models. Uh, one thing I want to point out is that you can choose, you could choose pretty much any AK and BK coordinate coefficients you want to create different sets of vertical levels to uh, give you the resolution you want where you want it and then stretch it out in the upper, upper uh, atmosphere. You see a couple of different levels here. These are GFS-like setups for our global shield model. Uh, a whole library of vertical levels of setup is, are defined in FB ADA. Uh, but one thing I want to point out, especially when creating new ones, is that you need to be very careful when creating a new set of vertical levels. Uh, you need to be able to make sure that you do not create uh, discontinuities in delta P or delta Z, especially over high terrain, since a, poor, a poorly designed set of vertical levels can create instabilities. So these are the two variables within the nameless that control that. Uh, and now I want to circle back to the Lagrangian vertical coordinate. I've been discussing how the uh, equations of motion within FE3 are defined along the Lagrangian vertical coordinate. And I want to discuss a little bit more about how exactly those vertical processes work within FE3. And this is going to tie into how the, uh, about how the nine hydrostatic dynamics works. So I mentioned earlier that uh, the Lagrangian vertical coordinate, you have all these different impermeable layers between impermeable Lagrangian surfaces between your layers that rise and fall with the, and deform with the flow. And it's that deformation that represents the, that represents the vertical motion and vertical advection within your equation, within your, within your solver. And this is a couple of different big advantages. Uh, one of the big things is that there is no current number restriction or on your flow. So here's an example from a global X shield model. This is a global cloud resolving model, which is a really cool thing I want to talk about more about on Friday. Uh, and we find in the lowest level that the W divided by DZ, there's a, about a 10 meter, there's about a 20 meter thick lowest la layer. And this gives you a vertical current number ranging between plus to minus 10. And uh, for an explicit solver, this would be unstable, but FE3 handles this with no problems. This is actually exacerbated in a higher resolution uh, in, in uh, or excuse me, in lower resolution in domains like the GFS or in our climate models. Uh, there's also no time, there's no time splitting that we need to worry about within uh, FE3. Uh, computing delta P and delta Z is sufficient to be able to compute your vertical advection in these cases, which isn't to say that we don't have an explicit vertical advective variable W, uh, but that's designed to be consistent with the rest of the Lagrangian vertical dynamics. Now, what we do is we allow these uh, Lagrangian levels to evolve over the course of your over the course of your integration. And now you could conceivably do this forever, uh, but however, what we want to do is we want to be able to remap back to the reference Eulerian coordinate uh, to avoid the the surfaces from becoming too disturbed, too distorted, and to avoid uh, your layers from becoming infinitely thin. That's the weaker stability condition that we have in the Lagrangian vertical coordinate that delta p or the layers cannot cross. Oh, and he, uh, here's a, simply an example of uh, our numbers here in X Shield. Uh, here's our list of vertical remapping schemes. There's a lot, uh, both piecewise parabolic method and the cubic spline that are defined within FE3. Um, I, one of the things, I don't want to go over all these different methods, especially for short range weather prediction. The uh, differences are pretty small. The, one of the big things is that if you want to do chemistry modeling, I might recommend eight for vertical remapping for tracers. Otherwise, I want to recommend that all the options use the same remapping scheme just to maintain consistently consistency. Uh, and now I want to discuss the semi-implicit hydrostatic solver. So, uh, so far, everything that I described applies both to hydrostatic and non-hydrostatic dynamics. Uh, and one of the great innovations that SJ Lin had is that he designed the hydrostatic al algorithm to be, very, to be very consistent with the physical laws of motion so that it could be relatively easily, and I want to say easy, not in terms of thought, but in easy in terms of how it's implemented, uh, to form the non-hydrostatic version of the solver. And the way that this is done is that we carry forward the forward dynamics as usual. So we, we integrate forward the quasi-horizontal invective terms as, as usual. Uh, we add two terms, we add a vertical velocity variable, W, and the interface height, Z. These are advected forward the way that all the other advected variables are. And these are advected consistently again with the other variables. So we maintain that consistency like for updraft helicity we saw earlier. And then we need to integrate the uh, vertical pressure gradient force and the sound wave terms. And we want to make sure these are done implicitly uh, to be able to be consistent 
want to do this backwards in time and implicitly so that a it's consistent with the horizontal implicit uh, horizontal explicit but backwards in time pressure gradient force that it's consistent with the vertical Lagrangian coordinate, which again is implicit in its advection, and that we don't have any current number restriction for the sound waves, which can, be, which can give you very small current number restriction. And the way that we do that is we apply a, try to, a semi-implicit solver. We form the equations that describe just the non-hydrostatic, the sound wave and pressure gradient point, uh, components in the vertical. And then we simultaneously solve for W and delta Z with, the, with those elastic and pressure gradient ter force terms integrated within them through our diagnosed P prime, which is a non-hydrostatic extension to the hydrostatic pressure or to the hydrostatic pressure in a layer. Now that's defined as a layer mean. We need to have P prime on the interfaces to be able to, to correctly calculate what our vertical pressure gradient force is going to be. So the way we do that is consistent with what we're doing with the vertical remapping is that we accurately interpolate that P prime, the non-hydrostatic pressure increment to the interfaces using the same cubic spline that we use for the vertical remapping. So again, this is the, another example of the consistency that we see here within FV3 and taking advantage of the same design repeatedly, which is not just good for, for software design, it's also good scientifically because it's all essentially the same, it's all the same physics in the end. Now, uh, this semi-implicit solver, the fact that it's implicit and backwards in time, it does introduce some uh, weak damping onto the sound waves, uh, but because these sound waves have a relatively weak meteorological importance, it's okay to do some damping of these vertically propagating sound waves. You wanna make sure, you don't wanna eliminate them completely, certainly, because you need those sound waves to represent the expansion and contraction of the column. But it, yeah, uh, but it is good to help damp them a little bit. Now, how exactly does all this work? And it seems kind of mysterious. One of the big things is that, and so it seems a little bit mysterious. The implementation is a little bit messy because tridiagonal solvers that are used for semi-implicit systems, they're a little messy. But I wanna explain how exactly the dynamics works within uh, the non-hydrostatic component. So right now we'll just focus on the, vert on the vertical propagation processes and the vertical pressure gradient force. And remember that we're using a hybrid pressure coordinate so that the cell mass delta P, the hydrostatic pressure, or is constant during sound wave processes. So let's say that you're integrating along, you're, you're, you're playing around with your non-hydrostatic dynamics, da 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 and you come to the point where you want to do the uh, non-hydrostatic processes. The non-hydrostaticity is creating a pressure perturbation that's beyond that from the hydrostatic uh, mass, uh, which you compute through the uh, ideal gas law. Uh, uh, you can subtract off the, non -hydro the hydrostatic component, which you call P star, you get the non-hydrostatic increment. And as those vertical gradients in the non-hydrostatic pressure, that's what creates vertical accelerations. That's what creates sound waves and vertically propagating uh, gravity waves. And that, those vertical gradients, they, they create vertical accelerations in the layers above, in the, in, the, in the layers within the solver. Those vertical accelerations, they act as straining or compression terms of each Lagrangian layer, which then alters the delta Z, the geometric thickness. And these are all adiabatic changes to delta Z. So you can you would essentially plug that back into your ideal gas law and you come up with the new non-hydrostatic uh, pressure increment, which changes P prime and then the whole process goes through again. And the reason why, and the fact that physically this all happens very, very rapidly. In the solver, we solve all, for all three of these simultaneously and implicitly, which allows us to take a reasonable time step. So that's, ba that's basically in a nutshell how the non-hydrostatic dynamics work. And the fact that it is a relatively simple extension of the non-hydrostatic, of the hydrostatic dynamics speaks to just how well the hydrostatic uh, algorithm was originally designed. So before I uh, move forward, I, uh, do I have any, uh, is there any questions before I keep going? Uh, there's no questions so far in Slack and uh, chat, please <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> okay, great. So now I want to discuss the uh, very, the unfairly, the unfairly maligned and relatively poorly understood idea of numerical diffusion. And the way that some people express it is that I've actually had one reviewer call numerical diffusion a, a numerical drug. And I'm going to be blunt, that's stupid. And the reason why is that because all useful atmospheric models have to have some way of removing energy that is cascade to grid scales. 
because there is no atmospheric environmental prediction model that I'm aware of that can simulate the, the scales on which the diffusion, the molecular diffusion is explicitly resolved, which requires resolution, grid spacing about a centimeter. In a centimeter, a centimeter grid spacing is gonna be pretty useless for a model that covers all of North America. Uh, we simply don't have a computer that big. So you need to have some way of removing that, that dissipative motion. And you can do that either through implicit damping or explicit damping. Um, and beyond just that physical grid a cascade to grid scale, uh, models aren't perfect and uh, you get noise at boundaries at discontinuities. Uh, physics, physical parameterizations go haywire. There's other solvers have computational noise and they must be removed. And so th this is an inescapable part of models, especially when you have discontinuities and some of the dynamical cores are designed to preserve two of the X modes very well. Well, you put, a, put them to resolve a discontinuity and they do a very good job of preserving the noise that is generated by that discontinuity. So you need to remove that too. Uh, but uh, beyond that, diffusion is actually a powerful tool to improve simulations. And so, for example, it's well known that for large eddy simulation, you need to have a large eddy diffusion scheme to remove, uh, to remove the grid scale motion that represented by the large eddies. And this is actually pioneered by uh, Doug Lilly and uh, Joe Smagorinsky, who are two of the earliest employees of GFDL. Um, but, and furthermore, even at non-LES resolutions, you can use diffusion as a powerful tool to improve simulations. And uh, we see this in a lot of cases. Uh, one of the most famous examples is our tropical cyclone simulations for, in a climate model. Uh, one of the reasons why GFDL was able to make one of the first models to simulate climatic trends in tropical cyclones is because we had a good representation of tropical cyclones that was by a good choice of how our diffusion was applied. So that's what the Zhao et al. 2012 article discusses. So FV3, as I mentioned, has a very wide range of use cases. Um, he says, so there's a lot of different uh, diffusion options within it. Um, you know, the physical consistency with FV3 produces very few computational modes and we can run it minimally diffusive, but you can get better forecast skill and better climate simulations by adding diffusion. And that's the reason why people add diffusion. It's not to cover things up, it's to make your forecast better. Amazing, the weather forecast model being used to improve forecasts, I know. Um, now, FE3 does not have any direct implicit diffusion to divergent modes. It treats those extremely accurately, but they cascade to the grid scale unimpeded, and so you, need a phys you physically need to remove those. And so we always add divergence damping within any uh, simulation, no matter what resolution. Now, the rotational modes, traditionally those are damped by implicitly by monotonic convection, but we add an explicit vorticity damping with an FE3 that for consistency also damps the other variables. Uh, we have no explicit damping for tracers. Um, I do want to point out that all implicit and except all implicit damping, except for vertical remapping, and all explicit diffusion is applied along Lagrangian surfaces, that is in the horizontal. There's no explicit vertical diffusion within FE3, and the vertical remapping is very accurate, so there's very little vertical diffusion as well. Um, there's a whole host of uh, there's a whole host of options within FE3 to control the damping. Um, I don't want to go all these in great detail, um, but I do want to mention that uh, there's a number of different options that you can go through. I'll give some recommendations a little bit later, later for this, for uh, convective scale. Uh, needless to say is that you can always define the divergence damping and the vorticity damping and other damping separately. You have a host of uh, other damping options, like we have this really neat way of a damp, of uh, restoring the KE, this is the kinetic energy that's damped by explicit diffusion. We can compute that and we can restore it as a heat, as heat, as basically a thermal dis, thermally dissipated kinetic energy becomes heat, which allows us to conserve energy and it can make storms stronger as well. We have a limiter for this because sometimes this can get a little haywire. I should point out that that limiter does not affect diabetic heating. So it makes no difference for how much heating is coming from your physics. Uh, we have a simplified nonlinear Smagorinsky damping. This is optional. Uh, we do have a two delta Z momentum energy mass conserving filter, which is useful. Uh, we have an option that's, in, that's new in the most recent versions of FE3 called SG cutoff. Uh, this allows us to control the, how it's applied above a certain level. It's usually applied in the stratosphere to be able to damp out some of the weird stuff that goes on up there. And as I mentioned earlier, I, yeah, I don't have time to get into all the details of that. Uh, it's, de it's described quite a bit in the uh, documentation, so I recommend you take a look. Um, but I do recommend that the 2 delta Z E filter, uh, which is applied just before applying the physics, it's not necessarily part of the dynamical core, 
but it is very useful for damping any of the weird stuff that could go on up the upper boundary and within the uh, stratosphere, all sorts of different weird shear layers can appear. And it's very useful for helping improve the stability of uh, simulation, especially when you have a well-resolved stratosphere. Uh, the upper boundary, uh, since we're using a upper boundary that has a fixed pressure and not a fixed height, that can greatly reduce the gravity wave reflection that, and thereby means that you don't need as many sponge layers to be able to damp uh, ver uh, reflections of the upper boundary. Uh, but now with that said, we do have some powerful methods for controlling that. Um, that uh, typically, I, uh, typically in the past, uh, the sponge layer is only applied in the top two layers of the domain and layers K1 and K2. Uh, there is an option in the latest, uh, I believe in the latest SRW release, this using the current GFS and GFS Ensemble to apply uh, damping, the, the, that damping layer, which is a strong second order damping to a number of different layers all above a certain pressure defined by RF cutoff, which also defines the Rayleigh damping that's used as well. One thing that I do also want to mention that's going to be very useful, especially you go to increasingly high resolution where diabetic heating becomes, or explicitly resolved diabetic heating becomes increasingly important, is the rigorous thermodynamics and physics dynamics coupling with an FV3. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the mass delta P, this includes the mass of the water vapor and all of the, of the microphysical condensates. So uh, basically, yeah, liquid water, ice water cloud, grapple, hail, uh, and rainwater. Plus, and you can extend this to define if you have extra rain quantities like our, our partners at NASA Goddard do. Um, and this gives us a lot of advantages that in particular being that condensate loading and the moist mass effects are baked into the dynamical core. So you don't need to do anything special to enable those. Now it does make applying the physics tendencies, especially the tra tra tracer tendencies a little bit more challenging. Uh, so the uh, driver, the, the physics driver that we've set up for FE3, it does have a very good way of showing how to do that. Also, uh, in the non hydrostatic solver, at least, FV3 incorporates the heat content of the water vapor and the condensates in all adiabatic processes and in the diabetic heating. And uh, this is a little bit more, this is quite a bit more rigorous than what is traditionally done, which the, the heat capacity of air, which is important for a lot of different processes, especially in the non hydrostatic solver, uh, is assumed to be constant and strictly the value for the air. And in some fine scale tendencies, the amount of uh, condensates and water vapor can be quite a lot which can give you a distinct change to the, uh, uh, to the uh, heat content of that whole grid cell. Uh, that full heat contact is also used in the diabetic heating so we can apply it consistently with the dynamics. Um, and that uh, the uh, diabetic heating is applied in a way using the heat capacity that's consistent for the, for the dynamics being used. And the hydrostatic solver, delta P is constant, the pressure, the hydrostatic pressure is constant. And it's delta Z, which is a diagnostic variable. That depends on your heat, on your temperature of the grid cell through the hypsometric equation. So we heat under constant pressure. Now in the non-hydrostatic solver, delta P is constant, but the full pressure, the non-hydrostatic pressure is not during heating. It's delta Z that's constant. So by the ideal gas law, pressure does change. And we want to apply constant volume heating instead. And there's a transformation within the dynamics that, do, the, the, the dynamics that allows you to do that. Oh, well, one, one other thing is that uh, recently I've seen some of the other uh, so, uh, some of the other dynamical cores out there. They started using the same sort of uh, rigorous uh, uh, thermodynamics, especially the variable uh, heat capacities that we're using. Uh, it brings to mind the, the old adage that imitation is the, is the sincerest form of flattery. Um, so you can see a lot more information about this. Lin Zhang Zhou gave an excellent uh, presentation at last year's medium range weather uh, workshop in which we had an extra half hour to describe this. I uh, want to briefly describe a couple of deb debugging diagnostic options that'll be quite useful. Um, the print frequency option, it prints out a lot of different uh, uh, global integrals at a different frequency, either in hours or time steps. Uh, it prints out a lot of information that shows a lot about the basic health of the solver or whether things are going haywire or whether the simulation is getting uh, a little off balance in terms of how much water is in the atmosphere, for instance, or at the very least, it gives, gives you something to watch while the model is running. Uh, range warn, this is a nice debugging capability that will check periodically to see where values are uh, of the different solution variables are going on. And if something's out of range, it will print out different values, uh, at, including their location in, in terms of the latitude, longitude, and height. And this is very useful for debugging. Uh, 
If you have a very difficult problem to debug, you can use this FB debug option. It'll print out a lot of information that, is, uh, that can really help debug a difficult problem. Uh, there's a lot of other diagnostic quantity capabilities as well. Um, there's this nice column sounding output that's in the most recent releases of FB3. Uh, you can output forecast soundings of this. Uh, so you can output uh, text soundings in the University of Wyoming format. Uh, for every radio sound location in North America, for instance, or you can just output the solver every acoustic time step for debugging at a certain location. Also, you can take a look at some of the advanced quantities from the history files to the diagnostics manager or the restart files themselves, which are very useful for debugging too. Uh, finally, some uh, thoughts about, uh, mixing, about model development. Um, one thing I want to point out is that when it, if you're designing a model, physics and dynamics must be, design, must be designed together. Uh, you cannot simply just pick and choose a bunch of different, different model components or parameterizations, cram them all together, and expect to get a good result. It takes a lot of work to design things together. Uh, in particular, this is true uh, for physical parameterizations, uh, the mix and match, or MNF and M, we call it. Uh, that's not, that doesn't really work. Uh, you really need to pick a couple of parameterizations and try to develop them together as well as with your dynamics to get the best result. And in particular, you can't really transplant physics between one model to the other and expect good results. Um, one thing I want to mention about diffusion is that uh, for weather modeling and storm modeling, I would recommend using a low value of the explicit uh, vorticity damping, a 0.3 or less. Uh, one thing actually our partners at EMC have found is that they're having stability problems when they're using a lot of damping. And usually you think having more damping, that should give you more stability, right? Well, it, it's actually not true. Uh, it can actually make your model less stable. So if you're getting instability problems, I'd recommend checking other things rather than just trying to blindly increase the diffusion. I also recommend using NRD2 or preferably three, which is either sixth order or eighth order divergence damping. Um, I would also, again, carefully look at vertical model setups when you're creating new vertical model setups. Uh, check carefully while you're designing them, make sure discontinuities and delta P, delta Z and the derivatives don't appear especially over high terrain. Another thing also is check closely your stratosphere. Uh, some of the damping options that can control the instabilities in the stratosphere uh, can be very useful in improving the stability of your model, especially given that we find that a lot of instabilities can occur up there that don't have an impact on your actual solution quality. Uh, one last, uh, two last brief notes. One is that uh, there's a little bit of confusion about what exactly FV3 is. FV3 is a dynamical core. It's not a model. The model is things like UFS atmosphere, AM4, shield, geos, and so on. FV3 is a dynamical core that all those use. Uh, so correct usage of the term FV3 is like FV3 is a dynamical core, the GFPL modeling suite, and other UFS configurations. Another correct way is to say that FV3 uses Lagrangian vertical coordinate and the Putman-Lin convection scheme. What's uh, incorrect, although it's very nice work that we like to see, is to say the microphysics and land surface model or whatever than FV3 have been updated. FV3 is a dynamical core. It has interfaces to the microphysics and it interfaces to the land surface model, but it doesn't have any of those things directly within it. And finally, if you can understand what exactly this means, well, no, I, I'd like to know what exactly this is supposed to mean. And then finally, I want to introduce the FD3 community. Uh, FD3 is one of the world's most widely used global dynamical cores. Uh, it was originally invented at NASA Goddard, uh, where uh, it's used in a variety of different models uh, for a uh, simulation of weather and climate and also uh, the atmosphere of Mars. It's the dynamical core being used in the Harvard-led Harvard uh, GeosChem community model, and FD3 is used in GeosChem high performance. FV is still the workhorse dynamical core for NCAR's CSM global climate model. Uh, they are evaluating FV3 right now. Um, the, our partners at the Chinese Academy of Sciences, they use FV3 in the climate model. Our partners within Taiwan, they're using FV3 as their weather model, global weather model. And of course, FV3 is a dynamical core for the unified forecast system. And it's one of its defining features. It's been used in a number of different systems already. Uh, so this shows just the very wide world of cap possibilities is capable with uh, a flexible dynamical core like FV3. And finally, I want to give a shout out for my presentation at 1045 on uh, Mountain Time on Friday to show more applications of uh, FV3. So with that, I'll uh, stop and I'll uh, take questions now. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, actually. Uh, that's a wonderful talk. And uh, we don't have... Uh... I didn't see the questions from uh, Slack and from the chat. Anyone raise? Anyone has questions? You can raise hands. <laughs> oh, Mike. 
So uh, there were actually was a uh, question in the chat much earlier um, by June Park, and I, I answered the first half, but I don't think the second half got answered. And the second half was, um, do you have recommended advection setups for high resolution simulations uh, approximately in less than 10 kilometers? Okay, so the uh, recommendations that I gave back then, those are for uh, simulations between 500 meters and 25 kilometers. Uh, it's not 500 kilometers, I should point out. Um, so that does include 10 kilometers or three kilometers. Okay, yeah. thank you. Uh, I do have a very short question about, uh, you said that there's a lot of nice diagnostic options in FE3, and uh, you can turn that on like maximum range. But uh, mm -hmm. do you have a document to explain what we see when we turn that on? Because there's a lot of information. <laughs> so which one is which means maybe will be very helpful for at least a general user like me. I'm not a dynamic developer, but I do want to see actually the my model forecast stable and uh, looks nice. <laughs> oh, sure, sure. So um, th there's nothing particularly uh, special about all these uh, about the diagnostics so you can see them right here on the right um so i mean some of the i mean some of them are a little cryptic like zs that means surface elevation but some of the things uh like uh mean dry surface pressure that's basically the mass of dry air within the atmosphere uh total water vapor that's basically an the global integral of water vapor within your domain um and we had that for the microphysical species as well uh those are things like maximum minimum winds including vertical velocity um maximum minimum temperature uh, maximum minimal, minimum uh, vertical velocity, um, sea level pressure, sea level pressure in the in the Atlantic, uh, an estimate of 500 millibar height if you use a global domain, um, and and so on. Um, okay, great, thank you. Is this FV3 document section 5.13 chapter seven has more details on this one? This um, information. Has, it, yeah, it has information about the vertical coordinate. I mean, I haven't written a documentation that explains precisely what the uh, output means. No, but um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But, okay. I mean, thank you. you. Yeah, if you do have any questions, yeah, then uh, feel free to. Yeah, anybody can feel free to email me at any time. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. So thank you. and uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, let's continue our. <laughs> Uh, training and uh, our next uh, lecture will be the overview of the FE3 limited air area model functionality by Jacob Carley from EMC. Okay, Jacob, please go ahead, share your screen. Well, all right, I will do so. Okay, everybody should be seeing the slides. Yes, it looks good. Perfect. Thank you. Looks good. Okay, great. All right. Thank you. Um, so, uh, following on the heels of a nice overview of the dynamic core, uh, we'll now dive into uh, the limited area model functionality. So. Um, I want to just acknowledge there's a there's a big group of folks that have been working on a variety of aspects of the limited area model capability. Um, I'm here just kind of reviewing uh, some of the results and some of the details that underpin the limited area model functionality and capability, but um, it was really a, a, a wider effort. Um, and if you're interested in all the details uh, associated with getting that capability underway, as well as some tests, uh, there is a manuscript out in uh, James. Uh, the link is there, and I believe I'll refer to it at the last slide too, but these slides should be available to everybody as well. So for those who want more details, that's the place to go. Okay, so some motivation. Um, FE3 originally a global dynamic core, and it had a couple nice uh, refinement capabilities, uh, notably with the Schmidt transformation, as well as uh, nesting capability. And however, uh, for limited area, uh, we, well, excuse me, let me back up. Uh, for convection allowing model applications, one doesn't necessarily need a limited area model capability. You know, you can run the global version and apply one of those local refinement techniques and you can get a very nice forecast um, at, at, at a fine resolution over uh, your area of interest. However, for operational applications and even for some research and development applications, sometimes it's more convenient to have a limited area model capability. And then for operational applications, we really do need 
uh, a limited area option. And so, uh, you know, some in some sense, this may be a little bit obvious for some, uh, but there are also some minutia associated with the operational NWP that uh, gets a little bit more complicated, and I'll try to explain that here. So one, the obvious one is it just doesn't require as much res much in terms of resources uh, running a limited area option. You don't necessarily have to run uh, a global model alongside it, you know, so you don't have that additional overhead. Uh, you may also, you know, if you're if you're wanting to run, uh, you know, global with a nest as well, you should also probably be concerned with the quality of the forecast of the global model since it's providing the uh, the initial and, and lateral boundary, or excuse me, the lateral boundary conditions and any sorts of two-way feedback interaction therein, uh, you know, you, you want to make sure that you have a fine quality global forecast as well. So in some sense, there's a little bit of additional overhead in terms of a, you know, maybe perhaps developer focus. Nonetheless, there's a computational uh, point there to be made. Second item is for rapid update data assimilation. Uh, for now speaking from the uh, operational perspective, so I myself uh, work at the Environmental Modeling Center, and what we're working on is development of the rapid refresh forecast system. And I'll have a talk on that, kind of going over the overview of that later this week, uh, where the SRW uh, is underpinning uh, uh, that effort. So uh, just as a quick example, uh, when we do a rapid update data simulation type application, uh, we have, uh, you know, we, we run the model as soon as we can uh, with the observations that we have. And so, you know, it, it, at first one may think, you know, okay, well, what if we, you know, we, we may get a better forecast if we run global with a nest uh, for something like uh, the HER. And in fact, it's a little bit hard to do because if we were to do that, you know, it, it might be nice to say try to run the GFS and the HER at the same time. The problem is that the 12Z GFS actually waits quite a while to get late arriving observations. And that's in part because its focus area is uh, medium range. And so, uh, you know, for high resolution rapid update applications, we're very much focused on the shorter term and higher in, and high impact weather within the short term. As such, we want to start the model running and do the analysis as fast as possible. So here is just an example. Uh, we note that the 12Z HER generally on average about starts, say for a 12Z cycle, starts running at 1223Z. And the 12Z GFS actually starts running at around 1445Z. So instead of running two global models, uh, which would be for GFS and something to provide, uh, uh, you know, the lateral boundaries for the HER, a limited area model just cuts that out and makes it a lot more feasible and a lot uh, less computationally demanding. Now, of course, there is an, some some potential issues here. Uh, you know, what do you what do you lose when you go to a limited area option? And uh, one, <clears throat> so that's just kind of highlighting that there. And that's something we can certainly quantify under the context of this new modeling framework, since we have uh, a diverse set of capabilities now that allow us to test this. So let's talk a little bit about constructing the lateral boundary conditions themselves. So um, here's just a little cartoon of what this looks like. Uh, there are a couple steps involved here. So obviously you need to read, you need to generate the lateral boundary conditions and read the external data. And you need to vertically remap the scalars and the wind components into the model internal structure. The regional boundary requires field to have three or four rows of data outside the integration domain. And that's what you'll see on the right. And I'll kind of explain a little bit of that in a moment here. The extra rows and columns are needed for horizontal derivatives. And then we need an extra row here. Uh, 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 we need fourth row pressure to vertically remap the wind on the third cell edge in the boundary. And so uh, we have two pre-processing steps. The first pre-processing step creates the grid's horizontal specification file. I think we reviewed some of that today. Um, so this is like orography, as well as static surface files. And the second step, uh, you know, in our case, we're using a, a output from the operational GFS. And those are the results that will be shown throughout this talk. Uh, to generate atmosphere, surface, and other boundary files. Um, so what's sitting in uh, these lateral boundary conditions? Well, we have the pressure depth and geometric depth of the model layers, virtual potential temperature, vertical velocity. Uh, there is horizontal 2D divergence, although we currently set that to zero. Uh, the D grid and C grid UNV wind components, and those are annotated. Uh, and a general 4D array holding all the tracers that are available in the boundary data. So this could be uh, something like hydrometeors for example. Um, I think the next thing I just kind of want to highlight here is that in this little cartoon, hopefully you can see my mouse, uh, 
Um, that area that just says integration domain, you can imagine, you know, this is where, you know, you're actually seeing or viewing your forecast output. This is where the model is solving the equations and marching forward in time. Uh, and it's a little bit exaggerated here so that you can see, you know, what the lateral boundary cells uh, actually look like. Okay. And so uh, that's kind of how things are annotated here. And we'll see similar um, plots like this throughout the talk. Okay. Now, uh, one nice convenient aspect. Uh, conceptually, the lateral boundaries are handled uh, in the limited area modeling functionality in the same way that they are for the nest for nest configuration. So this is rather convenient in terms of coding this up. We're able to borrow and leverage a lot of the same logic or similar logic. And it'll also allow for uh, some straightforward comparisons to be made, both in terms of making sure that things are functional and then also in terms of uh, doing some uh, clean comparisons between uh, nesting and limited area modeling capabilities. Some things to think about. Um, so here, the way that this is done is the states are prescribed, excuse me, prescribed along the edges of the integration domain. Uh, the limited area model does, you know, depending, it, it, it updates the boundaries are updated at a frequency at which you specify based on the source uh, input data. Um, so, you know, this could be one hourly or three hourly. Um, so that's much less frequency than what you would get from a nest uh, capability. And it's also, of course, not possible for two-way feedback uh, in the limited area model context. And so this brings us to an interesting research question, which is, you know, how does a LAM or limited area model capability compare to nesting? <clears throat> so uh, a little while ago, we did a lot of, uh, we did about a month long series of um, tests and comparison as a part of some work uh, with the hazardous weather test bed screen forecast experiment. And we were able to leverage that uh, test bed framework to compare uh, our net to a two-way nest and a limited area model capability. But before we get into some of those uh, the comparisons that were done over a case of 30 days, we just wanted to take a look, um, more sanity checks here, uh, comparing the limited area model in the upper left, the one-way nest capability and a two-way nest capability for this specific forecast time. Uh, take a look around the boundary edges. Uh, and, and here we're looking at 12-hour uh, accumulated precipitation on the bottom and then a 12 hour wind speed forecast at model layer four, which is about in this particular configuration, 267 HPA, you know, fairly high up um, uh, in the model atmosphere. And what we're looking for here is just a comparison between the forecasts uh, across these configurations. And so uh, the first, and, and the way in which these are, let me describe these a little bit more. Uh, so what you see here, um, in these kind of rectangular shapes or just the edges, or sh I should say the near boundary uh, areas uh, adjacent to uh, the lateral boundary edges uh, around all these configurations. And so it's kind of a zoom in on those things and it covers or it spans an area or uh, about 40 cells or 120 kilometers or so uh, inward from uh, the edges. So uh, you can kind of just see and examine, do kind of an eyeball comparison uh, across these. And so, <clears throat> um, so a summary of uh, what we're seeing here uh, is, uh, you know, the near boundary winds generally uh, meteorologically similar at forecast hour 12. Each configuration is showing wind speeds approaching about 40 meters per second or so. Um, so we're getting, you know, across and into that yellow shading here on the color bar. Uh, and this is near the western and northern part of the domain. And differences, of course, are present between the lamb uh, relative to the two nest configurations, especially along the western boundary, which is for these applications, these are configured over CONUS. And so that's more of the inflow uh, portion of the domain. And one can start to perhaps consider what are some of the differences we might see in somewhat less frequent update of the lateral boundaries with the land being three hourly in the one and the two way nest, getting those updates consistent on something like every time step. Um, the one and two way nests look very, very similar. Um, so that uh, is, you know, nice to see. And then in terms of precipitation, uh, forecasts uh, there, uh, largely similar across all uh, simulations, you know, generally speaking features, uh, prominent features are in uh, mostly similar uh, locations. So you can look on the Northern uh, edge here and see that, uh, you know, these precip maxima on the Northern part of the near boundary 
uh, portions of the domain, generally similar. Um, you know, nothing really stands out in particular. Same thing across the southern portion of the domain. We do see some differences on the western uh, boundary, which is somewhat consistent with what we see uh, in the wind fields. And what we'll do uh, here is just take a zoom in on where this red box is here, just to take a closer look uh, on the next slide. And so again, 40 cells wide here across the bottom. That's just a zoom in over this boxed area. So here's a limited area domain on the far left, the one way and the two way uh, is there on the far right. And so between the one way and the two way, very similar. Uh, there's some small differences in the details, but again, we're very zoomed in here. And then with the limited area model, again, you know, the differences between the limited area and the nest configurations are, um, you know, a little bit bigger, but qualitatively, uh, you know, the, the, the relative maxima are all in similar locations, although some differences do exist. Stepping back and looking at this, this gives us some confidence that the limited area model configuration is indeed configured correctly. You know, we shouldn't expect identical behavior between the nest configurations owing to some of those limitations that a limited area modeling capability uh, does have uh, inherent in its design. Okay, so let's take another uh, step forward here. And I got a bit of ahead of myself uh, earlier when I was talking about some statistical comparisons between a month long study. Um, and now we're gonna start encroaching a little bit on that <clears throat> uh, uh, here. So here we're, we're looking more into comparisons of, of between the, the limited area model and the nest. And now going forward, everything that we've seen so far and everything we'll see throughout is all the same initial conditions, physics and domain configuration. And so uh, the way there'll be more discussion on kind of how this is done uh, but you know, you begin with a C768 global grid, you apply a stretch factor, you get about a nine kilometer uh, grid on the cube sphere uh, where uh, face and then the nest and the lamb is, or, or grid is placed on that. And then there's a refinement ratio there that takes you to three kilometers. Okay, so the only difference here now, going into these next set of slides, so we'll talk about computational performance and then that uh, tests uh, over uh, a longer period of time, is uh, the, the nest configuration and the fact that the nest does have two-way feedback in the following configurations. So two-way feedback is now turned on and we're not uh, looking at the one-way uh, anymore. Part of the motivation for that is that the overhead uh, for running two-way relative to one-way is very small and any benefits, um, you know, and, and, and given that the some of the benefits you may get from two-way nest, it's generally the more commonly uh, applied application if someone were to run global with a nest. Okay, so let's talk about computational performance. Uh, this one, again, probably no surprise to most folks here that the limited area model is, you know, has much better computational conformance than running global with an S for fairly obvious reasons. One not need to run an extra uh, global forecast model uh, for limited area application. And so this is done at three kilometers over CONUS. And we're just looking at 24 hour forecast clock times here. So the clock times are total amount of time it took the, uh, the model to run is on the y-axis, on the x-axis is the total number of tasks. And we turned off uh, model history writes uh, just to eliminate any overhead associated with IO. So this is just pure you know, uh, integration time. And so one thing that stands out is that the limited area model completes in about half the amount of time in the nest for a given number of tasks. Uh, so that's uh, a big, uh, big item there. And then the LAM also uses less than half the tasks that the nest needs for completing uh, in a given amount of time. So for example, um, if you need your forecast to finish, uh, say somewhere around, uh, what is this, say 1300 seconds um, for the limited area model, you'd be using oh, about, and this is a bit of a coincidence maybe, but uh, 1300 tasks um, to, to, to do so. But for the nest configuration, you know, you're approaching uh, maybe 3,500 tasks. Uh, so big difference there, considerably more efficient. So some forecast performance. So also running over about a 30 day period, uh, we'll take a look here at first at some precipitation. Uh, this is a performance diagram. Uh, most folks are probably familiar with these, but just in case you're not, it's a really nice way to consolidate and bring together a variety of categorical forecast statistics into one nice summary plot. Probability of detection is on the Y, success ratio is on the X axis, shaded is critical success index, and in the dashed lines, you have frequency bias. If you're over near the top right, you have a near perfect forecast. If you're over on the bottom left, you have more work to do. 
on uh, improving uh, your, your forecast model. Okay, so uh, here we just have a comparison of daily zero Z initializations. These are forecast out to 60 hours and we're verifying uh, accumulations uh, covering a 24 hour uh, accumulation periods. Red line is the nest, the blue line is a limited area model. You'll note that they're very similar um, at all thresholds. Uh, so we're, as we get heavier, uh, the skills uh, start to decrease. You'll note that the lamb has slightly less uh, skill or, or poorer performance, uh, especially in these higher thresholds, but overall very similar. So um, moving on to the next one, fraction skill score. Uh, again, uh, now these are looking at the six hour accumulation period. So when you start to shorten the time interval, uh, your scores, you know, the forecasts become a little bit more challenging. And so here uh, we have the nest in red, the lamb is in blue again. Uh, we have confidence intervals uh, drawn uh, for the difference curve here, and they're at the 95% level. And you'll just note that the lamb is slightly less skillful uh, than the nest here for the five millimeter per six hour threshold. And this is only calculated over that last six hour period of the, of the 60 hour forecast. Um, so you can see that towards the end of that forecast period, the degradation starts to, to, to show up. Uh, note that nothing here is shown as statistically significant. However, if I think if our sample size is increased, um, those lines would, would become bold and probably rise to the level of statistical significance. Scorecards, uh, nice way to summarize a lot of different statistics. And so we've adopted them here. So uh, the scorecard on the right is looking at upper air uh, statistics. We have bias there at the top half and bias corrected RMSC at the bottom half. If a box is green, it means that the limited area model was better. And if it's purple, it means that the nest was better. Uh, the little arrows or triangles on there just indicate the level of statistical significance. So you can see that in terms of uh, bias, there's some degradation that starts to creep in around forecast hour 24 for geopotential height and temperature. Uh, and that just kind of gets bigger and grows just steadily with time. And on the bottom, we have bias corrected RMSE. These are generally very similar um, with some degradations starting to show up in the geopotential height field around 48 to 60 hours. So, um, that summarizes a lot of those, the comparisons between the, the limited area model and the nest configuration. And I wanna move on here now to just a little bit about uh, some of the improvements that have recently been made and are, and, are, and are available. And I believe they're part of the default configuration in the short range weather app. Uh, so the initial version of the lateral boundary configuration um, was set up in such a way uh, that the lateral boundary uh, states are specified at the edges. Now. Um, so we didn't have any special uh, blending treatments. Blending is fairly common uh, to use. And so uh, if you take a very close look uh, at some of the uh, edges, especially in the upper portions of the atmosphere, uh, you may see a little bit of uh, two delta X noise. Um, oftentimes these, these can be pretty small amplitude, um, tends to be magnified near the, the, the model top as well. Um, and then in this particular case, the wave tends to dissipate around 40 kilometers or so into the domain. So um, to mitigate uh, any potential issues that may arise, <clears throat> uh, we've also impl implemented uh, a blending function. And it's just a very simple uh, exponential um, uh, drop off. Uh, and here's just a very uh, basic little diagram of, of what that looks like. So you have your uh, halo points here. Uh, and these are the states that are defined in the halo region. And then these are just weights that sort of blend uh, the specified lateral boundary values at these points with the integration values uh, that are produced by the model. And this produces a bit smoother transition between the lateral boundary edge and the interior of the model domain. You'll note that in this particular case, the noise um, is, is reduced uh, quite a bit and it tends to uh, effectively address that issue. Okay, so closing slide here. Um, certainly it's uh, the, the LAM approach is more efficient than the NEST, not really a surprising result. They're quite similar in terms of performance uh, for forecasts less than 24 hours. There is some degradation that starts to show up at times greater than 24 hours. We saw that in terms of the upper air 
uh, bias scores and then some degradation uh, in the precipitation. However, we think that some of that is just probably a, a bit addressable. Uh, one is under the context of, uh, you know, the results here with a three hour uh, lateral boundary condition update, moving to one hour updates may help. The results we showed here did not include the blending. Be interesting to see what kind of impact uh, that may have. Um, and also there's uh, questions about the domain size. So uh, we ran over a small, uh, smaller, comparatively smaller domain than what we're trying, what we're planning to do for the RFS system, which will cover North America. But in this context, we ran just over the CONUS. So moving those lateral boundaries farther away uh, from your area of interest can certainly help, although of course that does come with additional computational cost. So I will stop here. Uh, thanks everybody for your attention. If there are questions, um, I'm happy to take them. Okay, thank hey, Jacob, you. Jacob, I have a Jacob. question. Yes. Uh, okay, go ahead. <laughs> okay, yeah thanks, thanks, Mike. yeah, thanks, Jacob, great talk. Um, I had a question. I mean, it's not surprising that you get some degradation aloft uh, when you run the LAM, you don't have the, the global information coming in at regular time steps like you you know you would with a nest. Um, what I'm curious about is the the alternating on slide if you go back to slide 11 where you have the the scorecard um, you have alternating statistical significance between the lamb and the nest being better for 250 millibar temperature and that, that's really weird. Do you have any feel for why that would happen? I mean that's not a diurnal thing because it's 250 millibars so I just I don't know I'm just curious. <laughs> No, uh, I, I don't think that we have anything um, concrete to say. I mean, these numbers are presented in uh, Kelvin. So, you know, the oh, values there are pretty really small. small. Yeah, okay. Um, and, and that may be part of it, um, but but truthfully, I don't have a good- um, Yeah, it could just, it could just be a fluke, I guess. I mean, how many cases did you, did you run? I, I missed that. About 30. Okay, well, that's still pretty, pretty good. Well, all right. Okay. Thanks. In my cases, yeah. Yep, sure thing. Okay, any other questions? So we, or do we, we not do have, have any <laughs> We do have a question on Slack from June Park, but okay. uh, Gerard answered some, it's answered something like uh, already answered. So uh, June, do you have more questions? If you want, actually you can speak up. <laughs> or oh, turn on your camera and uh, ask Jacob directly. <laughs> okay, maybe not. So I actually, yeah, you, Jacob, uh, because we have to move on to next talk, uh, I, I see you are on Slack. So if you want, you can check Slack to see if you have more comments on June's question. Thank you. Yep, will do, thanks. Thank you. Okay, Mac. All right, so yeah, we'll move on to the next talk now. And that's uh, going to be uh, Shanhu Jian. I apologize if I mispronounced your name. Um, he will be talking about the uh, extended trit mnemonic grid and um, take it away. Oh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. I should share my screen first. Hey, okay. hello everyone. Uh, my name is Chan Hu Chan at uh, NOAA EMC Environmental Modeling Center. Uh, I'll present the, the extended Schmidt Namani grid uh, called ESG grid in the UFS Short Range Weather app. I mainly focus on how to use the ESG grid uh, in the Short Range Weather app uh, in my presentation. I will start from explaining the concepts of the standard Schmidt grid refinement and the ESG grid. In FV3, using the standard Schmidt grid, uh, the global domain is comprised of six tiles. Uh, a regional domain is created with the uh, nesting capability of the FV3 grid. For a regional domain, tile six is used as its parent domain 
the regional domain as a child uh, is assigned to Tile 7. The resolution of Tile 7 in the standard Schmidt refinement uh, is de determined by the resolution of the parent's domain, uh, Tile 6, and the refinement ratio uh, it is typically 3. The ESG grid does not use the parent's tile to generate a regional domain. Uh, it is a standalone grid uh, with the halos uh, for the lateral boundary conditions. Uh, however, uh, it is still regarded as tile seven uh, in FV3 uh, for the consistency of the gridding, grid numbering. The ESG grid uh, stretches the regional domain over the globe uh, using two grid factors, kappa and A. Uh, geometrically, kappa is the Gaussian curvature of the initial constant curvature surface. By defining kappa with S square, kappa can be a negative value easily. The normal grid is well defined on a surface uh, of a constant negative kappa uh, as it is on the sphere. A negative kappa surface is called a hyperbolic plane or a pseudosphere uh, with an imaginary radius. A negative kappa value helps create a more uniformity across the domain, uh, particularly in the edges of the domain. Another parameter A is defined by kappa times B. Uh, here, B is the spacing parameter. The smaller value of B creates a, a more tightly spaced grid uh, at the edge of the domain. Uh, in the former version of the ESG grid generator, these two factors were specified uh, explicitly uh, in the name list, uh, but uh, in the latest version, these two factors are automatically optimized jointly uh, according to some objective criteria by the ESG grid uh, generator. The optimal solution depends on both the size of the domain and its aspect ratio. So we don't need to worry about these two factors now. In the UFS short range weather app, input grids are different from output grids. This is the characteristics of the UFS weather model uh, called the right component. As the input grid, a uh, user can uh, select either ESG grid or the standard Schmidt refinement, uh, which is called GFDI grid uh, in the short range weather app. Uh, however, uh, since the, the ESG grid was developed to overcome the weaknesses of the standard Schmidt grid refinement, the ESG grid is recommended as an input grid and most of the predefined grids in the UFS short range weather app are the ESG grid. There are three options for the output grid. They are controlled by the parameters of quilting and right component. The first one is rotated latitude and longitude. The second one is Lambert conformal conic. And the last one is regional latitude and longitude. All the predefined grids in the UFS short range weather app adopt either uh, rotated latitude and longitude for large domains or Lambert conformal conic uh, for small domains. I have not seen the third option uh, used in the UFS short range weather app uh, yet. And the slide, the left two figures show the input grid and the right two uh, show the output grid. The input grids uh, look denser than the output grid. This is because uh, they are the FV3 super grid. Their grid points are two times uh, as many as those of the typical computational grid, uh, such as the, the output grid. The, the FVC super grid uh, includes the center of the cells as well as the corners of the cells. 
The name list of the ESG grid generator uh, can be found in the template directory under the USH directory. Its file name is regionalgrid.nml. Here, uh, six parameters should be specified in this name list. Pillon and Pillet are the longitude and latitude of the center of the regional domain. Del X and Del Y are the grid spacing uh, in the longitudinal and latitudinal direction uh, on the supergrid. The units are in degrees. LX and LY are the number of cells in the longitudinal and latitudinal direction uh, on the supergrid from the bottom left corner of the regional domain to the center. Since they indicated the distance to the left side, they have the negative signs. These six parameters are filled in by the scripts uh, with the input parameters uh, uh, when the make grid task runs in the workflow. So we don't need to input them explicitly uh, to the template file. The panel on the bottom shows an example of how the name list is filled in the workflow. These input parameters are specified in the configuration file or predefined grid parameter file set predefined grid parameters.sh. Uh, this slide shows the flow to generate an ESG grid in the UFS shown range weather app. The first panel on the left uh, shows how the workflow is set up by the workflow generation script. I will uh, explain its steps in detail here, uh, but I'd like to show you the order of the configuration scripts. Uh, in the previous slide, I mentioned uh, the name list parameters would be calculated from the values in the configuration and predefined grid parameter files. Uh, as you can see, the workflow generation script uh, reads the configuration scripts in the order of configure default.sh, configure.sh, and set predefined grid parameters.sh. If you want to change the default values of the input parameters, in the configure default.sh, you should not modify them in this file directly. Uh, instead, uh, you can specify them with the new values in the configure.sh. Uh, when the grid parameters are set in both scripts of configure.sh and set predefined grid parameters.sh, the parameters in configure.sh will not the, uh, uh, will be replaced with those uh, in set predefined grid parameters.sh, uh, except for some computational parameters. Uh, I'll explain it later. The second panel shows the flow chart of the short range weather app workflow. The make grid task runs at the very beginning of the workflow. Uh, it is optional, so we can select if the make grid task runs or is skipped if you have a predefined grid in the workflow. The third panel shows the make grid task in detail. So as you can see, the make grid task has two options for the ESG grid and the standard schmidt grid refinement. Uh, this is named the GFDL grid here. The make grid task generate three grid files uh, with the different numbers of halos, halo three, four, and six at the end of the task. The UFS shown range weather app provides the 18 free defined, defined grids for user's convenience. Uh, their list can be found in valid parameter values.sh under the USH directory. Among them, uh, three RRFS corners domains uh, with 25 kilometer, 13 kilometer, and 30 kilometer resolutions are officially supported. Others are the test domains or institute specific domains. The input parameters for the certain grid are specified in the 
set predefined grid parameter start SH. So you just can simply call them in by putting the parameter predefined grid name uh, into the configuration file configure.sh. Most of the predefined grids uh, only have the input parameters for the ESG grid. If you want to generate a GFDL grid using the standard Schmidt grid refinement uh, for the predefined grid, uh, you should add the input parameters for the standard Schmidt grid refinement to the uh, script file. The important thing to remember here is uh, the input parameters specified in the configuration file are not the same as the name list of the ESG grid generator. As I mentioned in the previous slide, the grid parameters in the workflow are different from the parameters in the name list of the ESG grid generator. Pillone and Pillet are the same as ESG grid loan center and the center uh, respectively. The units of del X and del Y are in degrees, but the units of ESG grid del X and del Y are in meters. Del X is calculated from ESG grid del X uh, in the source code uh, with this first formula on the left. Here, the first part on the right-hand side uh, means the grid spacing on the, the FV3 supergrid. The second part is the ratio of a uh, whole angle of a circle and the circumference of the earth. In the current version of UFS utils, the radius of the earth is set to 6,371,000 meter but uh, it will be changed to 6,371,200 meter uh, in the latest version of UFS utils. Uh, this is for the consistency with FV3 and other utilities. For example, del X of the 13 kilometer domain is about 0 0.058. Uh, as you can see in the second formula, Lx is a negative value of the summation of ESG, ESG grid Nx and two times number of halos. This is because the domain has halos on both sides. Del Y and L Y can be calculated in the same ways. There are two ways to create a new grid in the UFS shown range weather app. Uh, one is to add the parameters for a new grid uh, to the list of the predefined grid uh, under the parameter predefined grid name uh, as shown on the left panel. This list can be found in set predefined grid parameters.sh. Here in the case statement for predefined grid name, grid name, grid generation method, uh, this means ESG grid or GFDL grid. And grid parameters, time step of FV3, computational parameters, and right component of parameters uh, should be added to the file. The other method is to specify the parameters for a new grid uh, directly in the configuration file, configure.sh. Uh, for this, first, uh, you should leave predefined grid name blank in the configuration file. Otherwise, the workflow generation will be stopped with the error message saying uh, the predefined grid does not exist. Then put the parameters for a new grid uh, in the configuration file uh, as shown on the right panel. I usually use the second method when I create a new grid. And then once the domain is fixed, I put the input parameters into the set predefined grid parameters.sh uh, with a new domain name as described in the first method. Uh, in this slide, I will explain one predefined grid in detail. Its name is RRFS. North America, 13 kilometers. 
Uh, this domain covers the entire North America, as well as Hawaii and Puerto Rico. Here we are setting up the ESG grid. The target grid resolution is 13 kilometer. The number of halos is six. Uh, this is the default value. As the output grid, we select the rotated latitude and longitude grid. Uh, on the right panel in black, some parameters are set with the values uh, of the table on the left. Uh, in addition, ESG grid NX and NY are determined by the extent of the domain. The time step of FV3 and the computational parameters, uh, such as parallel layout and block size, uh, can be found here. Uh, however, uh, as you can see, they are just default values. Uh, if you set these parameters in the configuration file uh, separately, uh, these values in set predefined grid parameters.sh uh, will not be used. The reason why these values are located here is that they are the domain specific values, so they are not changed in most of the experiments. In this slide, the left panel shows the boundaries of the final RRFS North America 13 kilometer domain uh, for the ESG grid and rotated latitude and longitude grid. Additionally, I set the standard Schmidt grid refinement just for comparison. Uh, once all the parameters are specified, we can test the new grid in the workflow. As I mentioned at the very beginning, uh, the optimal values of the two ESG grid factors, A and kappa, are calculated by learning the make grid task in the workflow. These optimal values for the specific domain uh, can be found in the result in NetCDF file of the grid uh, or the log file of the make grid task. Uh, as you show on, on the right. Uh, this slide shows the comparison of cell size uh, over the domain between the ESG grid and standard Schmidt grid refinement. The minimum, maximum, and average cell size can be found in the log file of the make grid task in the workflow. The maximum value is, the, is found at the center of the domain and the uh, minimum value is found at the corners of the domain. The nominal resolution is the target resolution at the center of the domain. The left panel shows the cell size of the ESG grid over the RRFS North America certain kilometer domain. And the right panel is that of the standard Schmidt grid refinement. Uh, as you can see, the uniformness of the ESG grid is much better than that of the standard Schmidt grid refinement. For this domain, the standard Schmidt grid refinement shows uh, some weaknesses in the computational point of view. The first one is that the size of computational cells is relatively larger than that of the ESG grid around the North America. The target resolution is 13 kilometer, but the cell size at the center is about 15.28 kilometer. This will result in a low accuracy at the main target region uh, of the domain. The second one is that uh, the minimum cell size is much smaller than that of the ESG grid. The cell size at the corners is 7.88 kilometer. This will reduce the time step much more and the simulation time uh, will increase significantly. There is an optional name is the parameter uh, for grid orientation in the ESG grid. Uh, it is the HMOS parameter PHG and its unit is in degrees. Its default value is zero. Uh, this means the first row and column cell is located at the southwest corner. Uh, 
uh, as shown on the left panel. When it is 180 degree, the first row and column cell is located at the northeast corner, as shown on the right panel. Uh, it, this is the same as the GFDL grid. Uh, this, this value uh, should be uh, set to 180 for use with GSI in UFS utils uh, in this release. However, uh, the latest version of UFS utils uh, supports both options of Southwest and Northeast. So uh, you can select the origin of the grid at either UFS utils or ESG grid generator uh, in the next release. And the parameter P edge uh, will be the default parameter in the next release too. So thank you for your attention. Uh, if you have any questions. I just had one additional comment on that PASI parameter. Um, it was actually added as a required parameter recently in the develop branch due to the rotation in the RFS North America domain. So now when you set up a, um, a run, uh, if you don't choose a predefined domain, then that PASI parameter has to be defined, even if it's zero. So just a, just a heads up for anyone that's gonna be using the, uh, the develop branch. Okay, thank you, Chang Hu. Are there any questions? I haven't seen any come through in the chat, um, but if you had one, feel free to raise your hand or speak up. Okay, and again, if you have questions later, please feel free to ask them in the chat. I'll be keeping track of any answers that, or questions that go unanswered. So hopefully we can get them uh, all answered over the course of the week. Um, and uh, our last talk for this morning or afternoon now in local time uh, will be by Gerard Katefian. He's going to talk about uh, the procedure for defining a new domain. Mike, <clears throat> so this is uh, a lot of it is the same as what Chen Hu covered. So I'll try to be brief. All right. Okay, so how do you define a custom regional domain in the app? Um, Gerard, I'm sorry, can you share your screen, please? Oh, I didn't do that. I'm sorry. Okay, how's that? Yes, we can see it now. Thanks. Okay, so we have two ways of generating grids. The, but what I've said, the GFTL grid method, the original from GFTL, uh, and then the ESG grid method. Um, I don't know if I should cover this again since it was covered. Uh, so, but I'll do it really fast. So the GFT grid method, it first sets up a global grid, a cubed sphere global grid, then takes tile six of that. And within tile six, it uh, extracts a, a sub, sub region of it, depend, which is specified by the user, depending on, you know, I start, I end, J start, J end. And that's, that, that'll be used as your uh, regional grid. The rest of the global grid is thrown away. You don't need that anymore. Um, and it does have the same stretching factors and refine ratio that uh, you have if you're doing like a nested run that Jacob talked about a little bit. So you can use that to make your grid uh, more, more to, to the resolution that you want. But the SG grid can do um, a lot better than that in terms of its uniformity. And as uh, Chan Hu said, that, that helps both the physics and uh, the time step. You have a uniform time step because your uh, grid size is the same over the domain. And, and by the way, the, the, the way the ESG grid does this is because 
it, it can do it is because it doesn't have to uh, meet the requirement that it meet other tiles and cover the globe. It's a regional grid, so it can uh, just take whatever shape it wants to uh, to optimize the uniformity of the grid cell size. So when you're setting up a new grid, the first thing you want to specify is the grid generation method, either a GFTL grid or an ESG grid. So you specify that. Then there's this other parameter that there were some questions about. So I'll talk about that a little bit, halo blend. Uh, and this is the blending that Jacob was referring to. So just to give some background, there are four um, halo cells that are on the outside of your domain. That's where the boundary conditions come in. This is not that. On the inside of your domain, there's by default halo blend is set to 10. Uh, there's a region over which that exponential blending function that Jacob showed is used uh, to, to weigh, to blend the solution from your external model um, with the one that the FE3LAM has generated. And that's to get rid of those uh, oscillations that you can get, which are due to the mismatch between the external and internal solutions. And so you can play around with that number if you want. You can use more than 10 cells if you wish. OK, the, yeah, this should, I don't know if, you, I, if it was me, I wouldn't call this a halo because then you think of the outer halo. Uh, just I would call it some kind of region, but anyway. Um, Chan, who covered these as well, so I'll just go through them quickly. If, if you're going to set up an ESG grid, first make sure that your pre predefined grid name variable is not specified in your config.sh file because if you, by default, that's set to a blank value. If you have it set to something, um, it'll go use that grid. It will, it'll ignore your settings for for your custom grid. So the first thing you want to specify for grid generation method is ESG grid. Then you can specify your center longitude and latitude. Um, your delta X and delta Y, uh, these are in meters dimensions, like you, if you're doing a 25 kilometer grid, you'd set it to 25,000, both of them. Um, so X and Y right now, they approximately correspond to the west to east and south to north directions because we don't have that PASI parameter in the release. Uh, but if that was in there, then you know the whole grid could rotate about an axis through its center and that would make X and Y not align, but you would still use, if you wanted a 25 kilometer grid, you'd still set them to 25 or three kilometers or whatever, you'd set it to 3000. Okay, ESG grid and X and ESG grid and Y are the number of grid cells in the X and Y directions. Um, and then there's final thing, ESG grid wide halo width. It's just this parameter that it's sort of a legacy thing where what we do is we first create a, um, a grid that has six external halo cells and then shave it down because that was the procedure we needed for the GFTL grid. I'm not really sure if we need to do that anymore, but it's just in there so that the same code can be used for both grids. So just leave it set to six and it should be okay. You don't need to change that one. Okay, now this one uh, nobody's covered yet. So it's, uh, it's good that I have it. Uh, so the right component grid, this, what is it? So this is the grid to which the output fields are interpolated before uh, writing them to files. So when you look at the NetCDF files in the output, those are not on the native grid. They're on this thing called the right component grid. Um, and then this interpolation and then the writing of the files to disk is done by something called the right component. I think it's called a component because it, it's a component of, the, of NEMS. But um, but somebody can correct me on that if I'm wrong. And why do we need to do this? It's because the UPP, the post processor, currently cannot handle uh, these GFTL grid or ESG grid types. It can't handle the native grid in the in the app. Um, and then another reason of, for to use the right component is that the original system in the FV3 called the FMS, the Flexible Modeling System, that uh, that writes data to file, it will it will put all output times, fields from all output times in the same file. So it just keeps going and the file is open. So you can't look at it while the forecast is still running. So what the right component does is split each time into a different file. So then you can uh, 
you know, once once your output time is passed and it's gone past that output time, you can start looking at your fields. Um, so yeah, so what what does the right component do? It it does this interpolation to a grid that UPP can process. Uh, it records the fields at each output time to a different file, separate file, um, and then it's also using a dedicated set of MPI tasks to do this writing. It's not using the same tasks as the ones used for the forecast. So the forecast can just keep going and it, it'll hand off the writing to disk to these dedicated uh, tasks. And that makes things more efficient. Uh, and it currently you can specify uh, three different types of write component grids. These are something called the regional lat long which is just an ordinary lat long grid, uh, a rotated lat long and a Lambert conformal. And we've only used the last two so far, rotated lat long and Lambert conformal. So yeah, so I should clarify, each native grid that you create has to have with it a right component grid, assuming that you do want to use the right component. And so for that, you can choose one of these three grids. Okay, so here's a picture of what is happening. Um, so this is the RFS Conus 25 kilometer grid that you guys ran yesterday. The red shows the boundary of this state of uh, grid. The blue is the right component grid, which has to be, you know, within, always within the uh, native grid so that you, when you do your interpolation or regridding, you get valid values. If it's stretched outside of it, then you, you'd have like NANs or undefined values on your right component grid. Um, the orange here uh, are the four cells on the outside, the halo where the boundary uh, conditions come in. And then I also threw in this green value, which is the external model for this case, this particular case, which is the her. So you can see that it has to go, you have to make your grid such that you're completely, even your halo is, is within your external models uh, domain. And here's a close up of what that looks like at the northeast corner. And by the way, the blending zone is right where I have this arrow. It's on the inside of the red boundary. That's where it would be. I didn't, I didn't get a chance to make a grid like that, like I have for the outer um, halo, the LBC halo. Okay. Oh, and so, okay. Some parameters that you need to specify for the right component. This um, quilting parameter, which is basically turns on off the right component. Uh, its default value is true, but if you reset it to false, it'll be the FMS that's being used uh, so that you'll have to wait until the end of the forecast to look at your file. But the fields will be on the native grid in your output file. It will be one or two files. There, there are three or four, but they, they don't correspond to one per output time. They're just, there's one history file, I think that has um, all the 3D fields in there. Um, so if you are turning on the right component, then you have to specify uh, the number of right groups and the right tasks per group. Um, so, so these are what I was talking about, the dedicated um, MPI tasks that do the writing. Um, if you have a big grid or if you're like outputting very, very frequently, you'd want to have like two, three right groups with a lot of ta right tasks per group. Uh, but I've, I've never encountered that even with a big grid. So I'm thinking what could happen is, you know, your right component can get backed up. Like you're trying to output hour one or hour two, but you still haven't finished writing, uh, outputting hour one. In that case, you'd want to maybe increase your number of right groups and or your tasks per group. Uh, and, the, and then the next parameter is the right component output grid. This, these are the three different ones that I referred to earlier, rotated, lat long, Lambert conformal, or regional grid. Um, then you specify the center longitude and latitude of your right component grid. And usually we set those to the centers of the corresponding native grid. Then the lower left longitudes and latitudes of your right component grid. These you have to do manually, which is a little bit of a pain. Uh, I've written a set of NCL scripts that do this, but they're not user friendly. So that's why we haven't put them in the release. Um, we need to fix all that so that you can just um, 
you know, run a script and it'll just spit out the numbers. You can put that in your configuration file. And then there are these additional parameters depending on um, what type of right component output grid you're using. If you're using a rotated lat long, you've got to specify the upper right uh, coordinates as well, uh, as well as the increment D longitude and D latitude. And if you're using Lambert conformal, you have to use, you have to specify the standard latitude one and standard latitude two for that coordinate system, um, the number of grid points, and then dx and dy in terms of Lam the Lambert coordinates. All right, and then uh, Lucas covered this a little bit, but I'll mention it again. If you change your grid or if you have a custom grid, then you also have to customize your DT Atmos, your layout, which is the MPI layout for your native grid, and then this thing called block size, which uh, has to do with the cache. Um, we leave that usually constant to something like 32, 36, but I believe it's machine dependent. I have, yeah, I have not understood exactly what it does. Uh, it has to do with um, communicating quickly with the cache. Um, so yeah, for DT Atmos, you know, the smaller your grid size is, the smaller it has to be. Otherwise, you get instabilities. And layout at X and layout Y depend on how many how many resources you have, and so on. Okay, and then here's an example uh, of what you would add to your configuration file to get a custom grid. Uh, this first set is your ESG grid parameters right over here. Um, the second one are the computational parameters for that grid. And then here, uh, first you ensure that you turn on the right component by setting quilting to true. And then you set all these other parameters that have to do with the right component. And that was it. If anybody has questions. Thanks, Gerard. Um, there haven't been any questions in the chat that I've seen. I do see a couple of uh, notes in the Zoom chat here. Um, Lucas Harris uh, said that there is an option to uh, output every time in FMS by setting a name list option. Um, I'm assuming talking about the native grid output. Yeah, OK. Uh, maybe that's in a later version. And then um, Ji Li said uh, that uh, I don't think the component right component has to be within the computational domain, um, and because uh, it will produce the undefined values, but UPP should be able to handle the undefined values in the data void region. Yep, it does it. it um, but then if you plot it, it looks really weird because right at the edge, it goes from nice defined values to undefined values or so yeah, it, it, it's up to you. You can you can still do that. It won't be the values won't be wrong. It's just your plots will look a little weird. Like I, I plotted surface pressure and my native grid was partially outside. I mean, excuse me, my right component grid was partially outside the native grid. And when I made a counter plot of that, of course, the pressure went from you know a thousand to zero. And so that just makes the plots not look you so just, good. Yeah, you just use a master it so that it, it doesn't plot those values like you do with a grad or something. Yeah, yeah. Like I mean, I, I'm referring to using our plotting scripts that are in here. Yeah, but you can do all those things. Yep. If you have your own plotting routines and stuff. So there, there actually is a question now um, in Slack from June Park. Are the general routines for calculating winds at Earth coordinates from GL, GFDL grid, are they still working for the ESG grid? Um, and Jacob actually just got a, a response to that. So uh, June was asking, it looks specifically because of data assimilation, since that's expected to be conducted with the native model grid. And Jacob says that DA codes such as GSI handle the wind rotations internally after reading from a restart file. 
Yeah. So one thing I want to point out is that we, whenever we write out to the history files or provide data to the to the physics, it's always in the Earth relative the Latlan winds, and we also have the option to write out uh, the A grid the Latlan winds to the history files that can be ingested by data assimilation. So there should never be a need for a user to have to uh, uh, worry about rotating from grid relative to Earth relative coordinates. Okay, I don't see any other questions. Um, thanks, Gerard, for thanks. and uh, all the speakers from this morning. Um, we have scheduled now a lunch break. So that's the conclusion of the regular presentations. So those who will not be um, joining us for the hands-on practice, um, thank you for being with us and we'll see you tomorrow morning at the same time. Um, for everyone who's participating in the hands-on practice, uh, that uh, will start at uh, 1.15 p.m. Uh, local time, which will be in 45 minutes from now. Um, so thank you, everyone else. And uh, we will see some of you uh, this afternoon and some of you tomorrow.